Hi, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, if there are any licensees in attendance who want to earn CE for attending this board meeting, please see Dixie Van Allen at this time, raising her hand. In order to receive CE, you are required to stay for the duration of the board meeting. This is the second portion of this public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners and is being held in person at the Department of Consumer Affairs Headquarters 2 Hearing Room in Sacramento. The date is Friday, April 22nd, 2022, and the time is 9.03 a.m. The members of the public that would like to provide public comment will be limited to three minutes unless the in the discretion of the board, circumstances require a longer period. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll? Dr. David Paris? Present. Dr. Lawrence Adams? Present. Raphael Sweet? Present. Jeanette Cruz? Present. Dr. Pamela Daniels? Present. Dr. Dion McLean? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. Moving on to agenda item number five, petition hearings for reinstatement of revoked license. And I will turn this over to our ALJ today, Judge Larson. Oh, there we go. All right, let's try that again. All right, you're up at the table. Excellent. We have a court reporter in just a moment. We're going to go on the record. We're not on the record yet. Um, so as soon as I g we go on the record, I'll announce the case, and I'll have the parties announce themselves for the record, and then I'll have each of the board members announce themselves. And then I'll briefly explain how the hearing is going to proceed this morning, and then if there's any questions, you can ask me at that time. All right, we are on the record. Good morning. We are on the record. It is April 22nd, 2022, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of revoked license by Joshua Han Cho. This matter is being heard before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. OAH case number 2022-031-048. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings presiding over the matter this morning with the board. And I'm going to ask the board members to please state their appearance for the record, starting to my right with the president. Dr. David Paris. Dr. Pamela Daniels. Dr. Dion McLean. Dr. Lawrence Adams. Raphael Sweet. Jeanette Cruz. All right, there is a quorum present. Uh, Deputy Attorney General, if you would please state your appearance for the record. Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General. And counsel for petitioner. Good morning, Your Honor. Members of the board, Lindsay Johnson, on behalf of Joshua Cho, who is present and to my left. All right. Uh, so with regards to this proceeding, this petition hearing, in the proceeding, uh, the board is concerned about the rehabilitation efforts Mr. Cho has undergone since his license was revoked. The way that the, the hearing will proceed is the deputy attorney general will give a brief overview uh, of the petition package. She will identify those exhibits for the record. Uh, and then I will ask counsel if there's any objection to any of those exhibits. Ms. Crawford will also give a brief overview of the history of discipline in this matter. Uh, and then petitioner will then have an opportunity to present his case. I know there's some additional documents that he's provided to the board. We will go ahead and mark those um, and admit those into evidence. Uh, and then Mr. Cho has an opportunity to provide any testimony. Counsel can question uh, uh, Mr. Cho. Ms. Crawford will then have an opportunity to question him as well. And then I will ask any of the board members if they have questions for Mr. Cho. 
I will give petitioner uh, another opportunity to provide any additional information he wishes before uh, the parties present closing remarks. All right, uh, just a few reminders. The board members have the benefit of all of the information in the petition package. Um, so if there's particular information you want to highlight in the package, please feel free to do so. But again, the focus should be on those rehabilitation efforts that Mr. Cho has undertaken. All right, any questions? No? Just a reminder, we have a court reporter here. She's taking down everything that's being said. So we have to make sure that we keep our voices up. I know we have microphones, but also that we don't talk over each other because she can't take down two people talking at the same time. So we just need to be mindful of that. Likewise, if you're going to read from a document, just read a little bit more slowly than you're probably used to, just so we can make sure that we make her job as easy as possible. All right, with that, Ms. Crawford, would you like to begin by giving an o a brief overview for the board members? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Again, Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General. I am appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California. Pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, I'm here to assist the panel in fact-finding, and my role is not adversarial, but intended to protect the public interest. By way of a background, the petitioner was issued a Doctor of Chiropractic license on September 7, 2001. That license was revoked by the board effective August 27, 2018. An accusation was filed on February 6, 2018, and a hearing on the matter was held on May 16th of 2018, from which a proposed decision was issued ordering respondent's license to be revoked. The circumstances underlying the accusation were that on August 30th of 2017, the petitioner was convicted on his guilty plea of committing insurance fraud. He was court ordered to 80 hours of community service in lieu of, in lieu of two years probation. The accusation charged the petitioner with conviction of a substantially related crime, insurance fraud, commission of acts involving dishonesty and moral turpitude, knowingly making false statements, and participation in acts of fraud or misrepresentation. The conviction arose out of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Investigations Bureau conducting an undercover operation where undercover investigators posed as patients to determine whether the petitioner would bill for services rendered to them, but not actually provided. The petitioner prepared reports about the undercover investigators, that he had treated each of them approximately 20 times using a variety of treatment modalities, including a great deal of information about the patient, which was determined to be completely fabricated because he had never met or treated the undercover patients. Petitioner admitted his wrongdoing but blamed his misconduct on poor office management because he claimed that some patient charts were missing components which required him to make assumptions. At hearing, the court did not find his argument convincing. As the court noted, better record keeping will not prevent petitioner from creating fraudulent records and reports if he's so inclined. Additionally, the lack of mitigation or rehabilitation evidence, the severity of the crime, and the recency of the events led to the petitioner's license revocation. Petitioner has complied with his cost recovery order and continuing education requirements during the time his license was revoked. And it has been approximately three and a half years since petitioner's license was revoked. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Crawford, if you would please identify the exhibits. Yes, exhibit one is the petitioner's application for reinstatement of a revoked license and the attachments prepared and submitted in support of that application. So we'd like that to mark and introduce that at this time. All right, uh, any objection to exhibit one? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit one is admitted. Exhibit two contains the certified copies of petitioner's prior disciplinary documents on file with the board. We'd like to mark and introduce that as exhibit two at this time. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit two is admitted. And exhibit three is the copy of the notice of hearing for today's hearing date. That would like Mark then introduced. Any objection to the notice of hearing? No objection. Exhibit three is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no other information to present. All right, Ms. Johnson, do you wish to give an opening remark? Very briefly. All right, please proceed. Yeah. 
very briefly because I am well aware the board would much rather hear from Dr. Cho than myself. As was just stated, he was first licensed in 2001 and for approximately 16 years established his career as a chiropractor in Southern California. In 2017, as was discussed, he pled guilty to a criminal conviction and then sat for an administrative hearing before this board via an administrative law judge. Understandably, at the end of that hearing, his license was revoked. While it should have been a perhaps unnecessary lesson for him to learn, it was nevertheless a lesson that was learned. After hitting rock bottom and having the revocation of his license and his criminal conviction, Dr. Cho turned back to the basics, treating himself both on a personal level and a professional level to seek rehabilitation at every cause. He started with therapy to address not only what had happened, but more importantly, the role he played in it and his inability to openly accept that role at the administrative hearing. After treating and examining those root causes, he then turned to volunteer work to see what he could learn from others in the community that clearly he felt that he was lacking at the time. He volunteered both in professional capacities, volunteering for mission trips focused on chiropractic needs, but also in personal capacities, food banks, working with his children. This moved into learning deeper lessons about not only what went wrong with himself, but his practice. Volunteering at clinics to learn their billing systems, to see how they charted, to understand the mistakes that he made, but more importantly, how other offices were able to run their practice, so that if ever he was allowed to return to practice, he had better models and better examples. He sought additional continued education, finishing his bachelor's degree, but also taking continued education for this board, despite the fact that he was well aware that it might never be something that he could use under the fact that he might never have the license again. Yet his commitment to the practice led him to want to stay up to date and current in changes and continuing education. He returned to criminal court and had his conviction dismissed, although certainly it doesn't set aside the fact that it ever happened, it at least shows that criminal court saw rehabilitation in him and recognized that. But perhaps more than anything, he became open, transparent, honest with those in his life, openly sharing what had happened, telling them the facts, the circumstances, and perhaps most importantly, his role in those facts and circumstances, something that was clearly by all counts lacking at the first administrative hearing. And we see that through the support that he's gathered, the letters of recommendation that are offered with the full knowledge of the situation and yet with the knowledge that the writer saw a change in him. And that's something that he and those writers wanted to share with the board. But as mentioned at the beginning, certainly most people probably are not as interested in my opinion of the situation and instead would like to hear directly from the petitioner himself. So with that being said, Your Honor, we would like to have you sworn in. Uh, so can we first address the additional exhibits? Yeah, absolutely. So that if you need to refer to those, we've already addressed them. Sure. All right, if you would please identify those additional exhibits. Certainly. So marked as Exhibit A are two pages of letters of reference uh, gathered after the petition was submitted. We'd like to have those marked and admitted into evidence. Ms. Crawford, any objection? No objections. Exhibit A is admitted. Exhibit B serves as four pages of additional continuing education completed following the submission of the petition. I'd like to have those marked and admitted into evidence as Exhibit B. Ms. Crawford, any objection? No objection. Exhibit B is admitted. Exhibit C consists of 15 pages of various receipt donations for volunteer work that has been um, submitted or, or Formed following the submission of the petition. We would like to mark and admit Exhibit C into evidence. Okay, Ms. Crawford, any objection? No objections. Exhibit C is admitted. All right, Mr. Cho, I now need to swear you in. If you would please rise. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. Please have a seat. And please state and spell your name for the record. My name is Joshua Chu, spelled J-O-S-H-U-A, last name C-H-O. All right, counsel, your witness. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Are you, sure, are you currently employed? Self-employed. And what do you do as self-employment? 
I do the wholesale of vitamins, supplements. And does that require a state license? It doesn't require any license. And could you please describe for us in a little more detail what the wholesale of vitamin and supplements is? Yeah. Um, for just a second, we're going to need that microphone a little closer so we can make sure we can hear you and, and everything gets picked up. Excellent. Thank you. Please continue. So, um, it is wholesale because I sell to the other practitioners in both in California, in the United States, and in South Korea because I have a, a network with other doctors in Korea. Uh, even before this, uh, my license revocation happened, and I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to provide. They are looking for the, uh, the nutritionists. There are doctors who prescribe, instead of medication, uh, nutritional supplements they use uh, as their treatment protocol, and they kind of prefer the supplement that comes from the United States and I was able to like source them and then be able to ship it to them so they can use it there. So that how it started. And are those other providers aware of your license discipline? Yes, they do. And how are they aware? Um, because first they're wondering why I'm selling vitamin instead of practicing and some of along the way and then some of them they are more of like a friends we have relationships so uh, I was able to open to them and also uh, many of them wrote a correct reference letter for me so I have to uh, open it up and discuss the matter with them speaking of the matter obviously we've heard an explanation but can you explain for us briefly your understanding of why your license was revoked Yeah, because um, I was very unethical, and uh, the board actually gave me the, the opportunity to provide if I have my remorse or put any effort to rehabilitate myself in my first hearing, administrative hearing, but I failed to provide uh, any evidence that any guarantee that I won't do the same, I won't make the same mistake again, and I didn't provide any um, any evidence that I have been rehabilitated. So I gave the board no choice to revoke my sense, my license. I I realized that later. I realized that um, the very existence of the purpose of the board is to protect the public from licensed professionals. Yeah, when I have uh, my first administrative hearing, I didn't realize that it is very embarrassing to admit that, but I view the chiropractic board as like, like a, a chiropractic association, <laughs> and I'm a member of it, those who gave me the license. So I was like, I went up there very unprepared, like, so uh, maybe uh, any record that reflects my hear my first hearing, or it looks like uh, I was very disrespect respectful to the board, but that was from the gross misunderstanding yeah, of the board. So yeah, I gave the board no choice to uh, to revoke my license because I was harming the uh, public. When you say you were harming the public, in what way do you believe you were harming the public? Yeah, because um, I abused the system, I abused uh, my license. Instead of like helping other people, uh, I comply. And I made a false claims on the insurance, which is fraud. And that caused the uh, insurance premiums to go up. And it gave a bad name to the profession. I, like I own an apology to other hardworking chiropractors. So yeah, it is uh, causing the society like more burden, and it, it is harming the public. 
At the time of your last administrative hearing, you were still on criminal probation, correct? Yes, I was. Has that probation finished? Yes, the case has been dismissed. Part of your criminal probation also included community service, correct? Correct. And do you recall where you completed that community service? Yeah, uh, it started off at the uh, church and uh, the corona, because of the pandemic, everything shut down, so I have to stop for a while. And there's another uh, church opening up, so I went there. So it's two different places. Yeah. Following your court-ordered community service, did you engage in any voluntary community service? Yeah, yeah. Um, the it is on the exhibit that Kaju California Food Corporation is like a food bank providing uh, like not any food but like a healthier food to the uh, those people who need it. I was involved with them even before uh, my license was revoked. I gave them, I, I had like a little health seminar. It wasn't to promote my practice at all, just like purely on the health topics. So I've been doing that before my license was re revoked. But after my license was revoked, I was not able to do it. So, but I was still like uh, involved there, uh, went there, helped them when the food came out, stacked them, distributed, just like, uh, um, like serving the church serving like as a member of the church and doing things like that was uh, that was one of my voluntary work I also I also uh, did at the, my other chiropractic offices and the GQC acupuncture offices and, and Dr. Kwan's he's a chiropractor his office I, I did my volunteer hours there let's break that down slightly so you said GQC correct? GQC and what did you do for GQC? I did, uh, uh, I prepared the buildings. Were you under supervision when you prepared those buildings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not submitting the building. I was preparing it, so. What, if anything, did you learn while preparing billing under someone's supervision at GQC? Yeah, um. Their practice is not personal injury practice. They are like they build to straight like uh, PPO buildings to the insurance companies, and um, I learned that it requires a lot of um, micromanagement and has to be very like accuracy and very ethical, like everything on the record. Those kind of things I learned. Which I was, it was, which was missing in my practice. And at Dr. Kwan, you said. Dr. Kwan. Okay. And just for the court reporter, can you spell that? K W E O N. And what did you, uh, what did you do at Dr. Kwan's practice? Similar, uh, I, I prepared the, the building, prepare, and uh, also, um, I, I made a website for him which he didn't have at the time. What, if anything, did you learn during his during your time at his practice? The same thing as a GQC. Like, uh, I consider myself to be a nice person, but being a nice person and uh, uh, but unethical is like a really bad combination. Very, it's, it's a disaster. It could really harm the public, but. Yeah, that's the way I was. And with a uh, professional, I learned that it takes a lot more than just being a nice person, be nice to the patient, but has to have a very high standard of moral and uh, very high, high ethical standard. Yeah. Is Dr. Kwan aware of your license discipline when he brought you into his practice? Yes, he's the, he, he wrote me a character reference letter he knows about my case. He's also, um, he used to be my associate. Uh, right after he graduated from uh, chiropractic school, he worked with me. I was first, his first employer, and later we became a friend. So I was able to open up and discuss the matter, and he has no problem accepting me 
into his clinic. In addition to your work at the church, Cujo, and then the clinics, have you completed any other volunteer work? Other than that, I don't have any volunteer work. You have traveled to various missions, is that correct? Yes, I do. Okay. And have you been paid for those? No, I haven't been paid for those. Okay. So can you explain for, to us briefly what your volunteer with the mission Oh, yeah, is? yeah, it's a volunteer work. Yeah, um, I was involved in Haiti mission. It's called Cairo Missions, run by uh, Mission Life International. Dr. Peter Morgan is a chiropractor. Um, after I lost my license, it was uh, Christmas time and the New Year, um, I tried to maybe try to keep myself busy or um, try to do something like meaningful. It was a very difficult time for me at the time. Um, I, I call it like a reverse karma that I already made a mistake. I want to do something like better. Uh, something that I can give back. My, it can be my time, like a donation, anything. And uh, I try to do something meaningful. So I find this uh, Cairo mission trip and I went there. I expected it to be like a one-time thing, but then I ended up like uh, keep going there. I made like uh, six different trips now, like two to three times a year. And can you briefly describe for us what they do at the Cairo mission? Well, as the as name suggests, uh, they do they do uh, they do chiropractic in serve uh, serve chiropractic in people in Haiti and Dominican Republic. And what do you do for them on at the Cairo mission? Yeah, uh, I was there to. Uh, they they also have a they also created a birthing center. That was something new when I was involved. It was like starting it. And they also uh, have orphanage there. The orphanage doesn't have uh, electricity, so some, they, sometimes they have no electricity at all. And so they're putting a solar panel. I was helping with those kind of things, making, um, doing construction work, uh, setting up the solar panels, and setting up the chiropractic nursing center those kind of things. What, if anything, did you learn from your time at the Cairo Mission or, or any of the volunteer work, but at the Cairo Mission? Yeah, um, yeah. When I first went there, I was more like, I was thinking everything's in terms of a materialistic way that I was giving my time, my, my energy, like my donation, my toy, I give them the kids at the orphanage, my toys close like giving I was giving them something but then it was actually um, very healing for me I, I, re I received from a lot from them so that's why they made me keep going back there and also um, the doctors that I met there the chiropractors they're like really dedicated um, they rather give than receive they use their license like in a very uh, meaningful, like a right way, very different than the way I was abusing it, and very different than the, uh, like in LA when I was practicing, we're like, we all competing, a very different environment, so uh, I was very impressed, and I was very grateful that I was able to like be connected with them, um, take some of them as like, as a, uh, my mentor, and having a network relationship with them because they're giving me a, such positive influence. Following your revocation, did you seek any therapy or mental health? I did. And what was the reason for that? Yeah, um, it wasn't that I was going through depression or like that, but I would take a medication if it was depression, but it was very uh, depressing moments. It was a very difficult time for me. Um, and I never had a counseling before. I have some kind of sort of like expectation. And I tried to like uh, put myself together, not losing it. So that was the motivation for the counseling therapy. 
And what, if anything, did you learn during therapy? Yeah, I had about 10 sessions, like each session. Yet the purpose of the therapy is, is to, it's therapy, to heal myself, right? But um, the, the therapy proves every time I, we discuss like a one hour session, last 10 minutes is about therapy. 45, 50 minutes, we discuss the matter. Each time, like, uh, she asked me how I progress compared to my last. So, for the first time, I was able to, like, open up and discuss the, the matter, the, my license revocation and my fraudulent activity. Before, I wanted to, like, hide it. I didn't want it to be exposed. I, want, I just was praying, like, the time goes by so quick, like, three, four years gone by, then I get my license. Uh, Hopefully reinstated and nobody know about it. That was my my hope, like a human nature. I wanted to hide it, but uh, I was able to bring it up and make a discussion, like a very deep conversation for the first time. And have you now discussed your situation with others? Uh, yes, I do. And what has that been like? How have those conversations impacted you? Um, it's not. It's not like that. I'm able to like openly discuss this because I don't feel shameful. I do. But. Uh, Sorry. <coughs> I'm able to discuss this with my um, kids now, so I can give them like a better moral comp compass, like uh, give them lesson from bad mistakes. So, yeah. Um, on that note, what lessons do you believe that you've learned since the revocation of your license? Yeah, I didn't uh, realize it was a privilege to have a or the license that I'd be able to serve people. I used the license, to, I only abused it. Um, I used it to everything for personal gain, I guess. Professionally, personally, f for my own gain. But um, along with the counseling, the therapy, and uh, my mission at the Haiti trip, seeing other chiropractors who's doing much better, I, I realize how important, how precious it is. I learned that. Have you done anything to fill in your gaps of knowledge when it comes to chiropractic? Yeah, um, I, con I did a continuing education. I went to live adjusting seminars and I read a, a books on chiropractics. I try to stay up to date. Have you taken any education that is not related to chiropractic? Uh, some nutritional courses, functional medicine they call it. Do you understand if, if your license is reinstated, it might be subject to probation? Yeah. And would you abide by those probationary terms? Yes. What, if anything else, would you like the board to know? Yeah, um, I know it's only a word that coming out of my mouth is very hard to convincing um, that I have been rehabilitated, but um, it's, that's why it's so frustrating, but it's not, it's not like a, it's so frustrating that I wanted to quit, but it's more like a um, 
frustrating, but it doesn't matter how frustrated it is. I want to uh, really, like, assure, I know I said a, a word like assure, I wanted to convince, keep repeating, but yeah, I, I, I went through the, some transformation. Um, and I, ha I, I have a heart. That's why I'm keep. Uh, that's why I'm asking for reinstatement, applying for the reinstatement. So try to be a, a better member of the profession, not not harming the public, not harming the profession. So I I hope that to be like understood. I have no further questions. Right, Miss uh, Crawford, any cross examination? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Cho. Good morning. When your counsel asked you about why your license had been revoked, you said you, had, you were unethical. Correct. Can you describe in your words in what way you were unethical in your practice that led to your revocation? Right. I fabricated the buildings and I was the only one in the practice, so I was in full charge, uh, full responsibility. And I fabricated the building only, build, uh, only to, for the gain. And it is to comply with the uh, law offices. Try to, like, it's not that they tell me to do it, or um, I'm not blaming them, but I try to under business like an unethical way, so that's why I, I say it's so unethical. Okay. And through your counseling, what have you learned was the reason why you went down that unethical path? The reason why? Yeah, like I said from the beginning, um, there's like a different characters involved like in every doctor, right? So it is embarrassing, embarrassing to say that right now, but I consider myself to be a, a confident doctor, a good, and a good doctor, patient liked me. And I was, uh, that was everything um, I was focused on. And on the building side, on the system, I was unethical about how I should like be, like Dr. Kwon and GQC acupuncture, those doctors. I don't know if it's a right word, but they're afraid of the system. They respect the systems, which I was lacking of. So that's just, in another word, that's uh, unethical. So did you feel that you were entitled to more than what um, you might be getting paid for, and so you were unethical in your billing? No. You're saying, like, if I uh, fabricate the bill, do I get something extra? Yes. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay. Like, I lose, I lose, um, I lose business if uh, I... Every bill I submit is like a very low. Yeah, the law office doesn't work with the, uh, my office. Okay. So I was afraid of that, I guess. Okay, so you were you were afraid you might lose some referrals from the law offices if your billings were too low. That's correct. Okay, and from your um, statement, I understand that. Uh, taking car accident cases was not something that was uh, your passion. Yes. So why did you start taking those car accident cases? Yeah. Um, there was a little time off. Like in year 2009, 2010, I visited Korea. Like uh, I worked there. And that's where I uh, get network with uh, doctors in Korea. And I came back. Um, I was doing mo my, most of my practice involves decompression and straight chiropractic. 
adjustment, a little bit of nutritional counseling. But um, personal injury, PI, accepting PI cases was like an easy, easy route. Deemed to be, uh, eventually uh, it cost me too much and it, it wasn't, but then um, that's how I started it when you ask me why I started it. Do I understand it was it was a way to gain additional income? Yes, yes, okay. correct. And since your revocation, uh, what paid employment have you had? Um, me as an employee? Yes. I didn't work as an employee. I was self-employed the whole time. Okay. So for, um, you said you did some billing for GQC that was volunteer work? Yeah, it wasn't paid. Okay. It was like I, I have to find something, maybe try to keep myself busy, or doesn't want to leave the scene, like a ghost at the haunted house, doesn't want to leave the chiropractic scene. Okay. So and those are my friends, so I went there like a, as a volunteer work. And honestly, the first one, the. Dr. Kwan's office is a little different, but then GQC, the first volunteer work, um, it was as a, as part of like um, my rehabilitation that I want to provide it to the court and the, to the board, like uh, that I'm doing volunteer work. So yeah, that was the intention initially. How did you start your business after your revocation? How did you start your business? Yes, um, it it start um, not after. It's not something that I start because I lost my license. It was already happening and started before my license was revoked. So I was just be able to focus on that. I mean, only I was able to. I was only able to focus on that, and because I was not able to practice. And what, is, what does this self-employment look like? Can you tell me how you get patients, how you provide them with Yeah, I don't, get any, I don't get any patients. I sell it to the, uh, the doctors. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it came from the relationship, and I gave them the uh, good price and the quality uh, supplements. Like they look at the ingredients and everything, and they see the reviews. And so I was able to give them the good, qual uh, good quality supplement with a with a reasonable price. So I earned their business as I was growing. Okay. What involvement do you have with the doctors when they, in deciding what supplements those doctors are going to purchase from you? When, when they cannot decide? In deciding um, means. Go ahead. Like, yeah, um, yeah, right now, the, my supplements, the wholesale business, I don't, I don't have any like marketing. I don't, I don't give them the, like, uh, the booklet, pamphlets, you know. It doesn't require, it doesn't uh, involve any marketing efforts. It's only from, like, uh, from the word of mouth. So, um, so, so I don't appeal. I don't bring some product and then appeal to them like, oh, why don't you prescribe this? I don't. I don't do that. It doesn't require any of that in my in my business. They they already know what they want. Okay. They ask me if I can source it. If I can find this like a certain formulation, if I can find it, then I help them. Okay. So you don't provide any kind of. Um, information to them or tell them what the supplements can or cannot do? No, they have much better knowledge than I do. So, and then, yeah, okay. they're, they're, they, they're very proud of themselves. They don't ask me that. Yeah. And, and are these um, medical doctors or chiropractors, dentists? Who, who are these individuals? The doctors in uh, Korea, they're medical doctors. There's no uh, chiropractic profession, like okay. licensee, so they cannot treat the patients. So those, they are the medical doctors. But some also hold a chiropractic license. They came here and then get the chiropractic license. So they're, they're MD and the DC at the same time. Yeah, 
um, but some of them just sell only MDs. Yeah. And are the majority of your sales to Korean professionals? Um, yes, correct. Okay. And where do you source your uh, products from? Um, like Douglas Labs, can, like name, uh, um, um, Pure Encapsulation, Zymogen, those are some of the brands that I, um, I used as well when I was uh, practicing, like also molecular, like. Okay. Yeah. So you obtain the supplements from those companies mm -hmm. and then you're able to yes. turn around and. Yes, I, I, get, I, get, uh, I get, get it from the manufacturer and then I ship it to, to Korea and I'm the middleman, uh, wholesaler. So do you have to have any kind of uh, a medical type license in order to obtain the vitamins from Douglas Labs and Pure Encapsulations at a wholesale price? No, I don't. Do you buy it at a retail price? Um, they provide uh, they provide at the wholesale price, but they're not only selling it to the uh, licensed professional, so that's why I'm able to get that. How are you able to get it at a wholesale price? Um, they understand my roles, that I'm a wholesaler. I'm selling, providing to the medical professionals. So um, they understand what I am doing. And I bring them the business, so they, they are okay to sell it to me. Okay. And is there anything you needed to provide to them to, uh, for them to be able to sell you the supplements at a wholesale price? No, only requirement was um, not 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 at that uh, wholesale price. They didn't have any requirement for how what price I'm selling it. But if I sell it sell it like online, like in a discounted price, it will be a problem with them. They don't want me to do that. So as long as I avoid that, and also if I ship it to a general public in Korea retail in Korea, that's also a problem because they have a presence in Korea. They have a distributor in Korea. So those kind of things um, that I cannot do it, they don't want me to do it. But other than that, uh, me selling at the doctors, at the, oh, oh, um, the doctors in Korea, they are selling it to their patient in Korea at the higher price. They are almost getting it at the retail price here. So. Yeah, so it's a little different system. Ms. Crawford, we're going to just go off the record and take a brief break. We have a, a one of our board members who needed to step out, so I want to make sure she can come back in and continue to hear Mr. Cho's testimony. So we're off the record. Looks like everyone's back, and uh, we'll resume the meeting. I'll turn it back over to Judge Larson. All right, thank you. All right, Ms. Crawford, continued cross-examination. Thank you. When you went to work at GQC, whose idea was it for you to do billing there? Um, I can't, I think it's mutually, there's nothing much that I could do. Uh, and uh, the billing, the like I said previously, previously stated, their billing is like a little different than personal injury. They don't do personal injury cases. They only bill to the uh, like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, those are straight billings. Um, I like I wanted to learn, so I think I, I say it's my idea. Yeah, I request it. And did you have to um, reassure the person that was supervising you that you can be trusted with billing since that was a basis of why you lost your Yes, life? yes, yeah. I'm not submitting the billing. I was preparing it. So it is their responsibility and it is their gain. So she has no reason to distrust me. Like I, there's nothing I can cut like in the middle or anything. So yes. Yeah. And she's also been my friend. We worked together before, and we had no problem. Trust issue. Now, 
Now, I know you also did some volunteer work in Haiti, um, and you said it was a, it was Ky with Cairo missions? Yes. So, why did you um, reach out to Cairo missions instead of maybe a mission that is unaffiliated with your revoked license? Oh, yeah, um... I don't know, I, I happen to find the chiropractic mission first uh, before I find any other missions. And of course, I'm not going to go to medical missions. If I find a, a mission, it's going to be a chiropractic mission. It, it is also a Christian chiropractic mission. So. But, you, but Cairo Missions performs chiropractic on people in Haiti, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. So why would you go with a mission where you can't perform the services that, of yeah, the yeah. mission? Yeah, I understand. I didn't go there to uh, do chiropractic adjustments um, because I know they, they have an orphanage there and then they also do a lot of other things so I was be able to involved. So, and after my first trip, I took all my family, my wife, my three children. So even they have things to do there. So there's a lot of thing, a lot of things to help them. And my son followed me there like three times. It kind of became his mission as well. And, and after my first trip, and especially when I was preparing the. Um, reinstatement with uh, Miss Lindsay, I go over the like regulation. I was very careful not to like um, adjust people there because it will jeopardize, it will be a problematic. So I was very careful about that. But so did Peter Morgan, the director of Cairo Missions, know that your license was revoked? Yes, he wrote me a character reference letter. Okay, and he was aware that you would not be doing any chiropractic care out there? He does. Okay. So you did not perform any kind of care that would be deemed chiropractic? Yeah, like I said, I was very careful about it. So, okay. yes. So, you know, on my first trip, it was, there were students there. So I helped them. We discussed about like the different technique adjustments. So um, that's where I've, they're wearing like a t-shirt representing like a new technique that wasn't there when I was in school. That's why I went to one of the uh, seminar there. So there's like a little bit of, um, I would say, uh, academic discussions. But it's not that I go there perform chiropractic to people in Haiti. Okay. No. So, so you might have had some, some uh, consulting type discussions, but you did sharing your knowledge, but yes. you didn't actually put hands on anyone. That's correct. When you did your coursework in um, ethics and professional billing, was there anything that you learned there that you were able to uh, take away to apply to your practice if your license is reinstated? Yeah, yeah. Um Uh, you have to respect the system. You have to know the, the, the what I mean by respecting is that the, know the law like in details and be able to like micromanage it. Don't like uh, uh, cutting corners. That everything is uh, it could be a very problematic for professionals. Professional it takes much more than just being a nice doctor, but also like respect the systems and go by the like law, those kind of things. And I at the uh, those seminars, they show a lot of like cases, court cases, like chiropractic cases. So I we I was able to watch like watch them and yeah, um, and I was one of them. So it is like it looks really really bad how like uh, it's. They are giving the bad name to the professions. 
and also harming the public. Yeah, those um, those I learned. I should be like really careful, and the, the, the respect the system. Okay. I want to ask you about some of the letters that you submitted. One of them is from Cecilia Han Soon Chung, and it was on page twenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she mentions that in the second in the second full paragraph that uh, you guided her through hard times and answered questions other doctors didn't care to answer, and that her cancer treatment was successful with your help. So what, is, what kind of services did you provide to her that was relating to her cancer treatment? Yeah. Oh, it's, she mentioned cancer treatment, but I didn't give her the advice on cancer. She has the uh, severe back pain that she and I believe came from the side effect of the chemotherapy that she's gone through. And that's how, that's why she first came to my office because of the low back pain. So I, I think she meant that, that I helped with her. Um, as, as a result, as a result of her cancer, she also have a low back pain. I help her with the low back pain. And so she also mentions in August 2018, she started having that severe back pain and visited you for some treatment. Now in August of 2018 is also when your license was revoked. So did you ever see her after your license was revoked? After I, my license revoked, I didn't see any of the patients. So I think that's her mis, uh, mistakes. So she provided her contact information, so it should be verified. Okay. Another letter is on page 28. And that is from Yoon Kim. Yeah. And this letter states that um, they had chronic shoulder pain and recovered through you vo your volunteering program. What what is what is the volunteering program that is referred to here? And this is in the second paragraph, about halfway into the paragraph. Yeah, um, this is the one that I uh, discussed earlier. That before my license was revoked, uh, I. Had I had a I had a health seminar there, like I was talking about anti-inflammatory food. If if you keep taking medication but you still supply with the food that inflame, then it's like you try to put the fire extinguisher but also put the oil at the same time, so it's not gonna get healed. Like those kind of um, the seminars I gave to them. So she. I assume she's trying to say that uh, even without like a patient treatment, uh, with throughout the seminar and the, the information that I provided, some of the like members there who was attended the seminar, uh, they came up with some testimony like uh, their uh, blood pressure level got better or like it's nothing related to chiropractic, but it, it is their testimony. So I think that's what she meant. And this. Um, this, she means before my license was revoked when I was able to give them the whole seminar. Yeah. Okay, so this was an attendee at your at a seminar in. The, I don't know if she mentioned the date there, but um, yeah, they don't want they don't want a, a, a chiropractor who lost who license revo uh, revoked to keep the seminars there, so yeah, yeah, it didn't happen. And on page 43, this is a letter that was written in 2021, and in that first line, it indicates I've been working as his employee for about two years. 
Miss Crawford, yes. if you could just talk into your oh, microphone. Sorry. As you look down at your read, we lose, we lose your shadow. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, on page 43, in the first line, the author writes, mm -hmm. I have been working as his employee for about two years. And what employment is this person referring to? Yes, uh, she's the office manager to handle the the wholesale distribution of the nutritional supplements. She's your office manager? She, she, yes. Okay. Not, not on the clinic, not at the clinic, um, not as a, a chiropractic assistant, but um, to handle the, the wholesale of uh, supplements. Okay. So in your supplement business, she's your in, she is, yes. office manager. Okay. What assurances can you give the board that the incidents that led to your license being revoked would not happen again if your license was reinstated? Assurance, yeah. Um, yeah, giving, well, Assuring myself is easy, but assuring other people is very hard. But um, I went through the total transformation, I believe, and I don't look at my chiropractic license as a tool to uh, make a living or make money anymore. But I wanted to be. I'm doing very fine with my uh, wholesale business right now, but I still want the chiropractic license reinstated because. Of course, I want to set the record straight. Um, I don't want to like ended up being a human, uh, human being who like uh, committed a fraud and lost license. But I wanted to get it back, and also I want to use the license to help others, like those doctors that I've I've been influenced, met at the Haiti. They're using the license in much more uh, better way. So, um, and I can continue to do my uh, education and anything that required by the board. If the board has to monitor me, I'm open to it. And yeah, those are the, sh yeah, that's how I wanted to appeal. Do you plan, if your license is reinstated, do you plan to open up a private practice? Yes, um, there's a patient who still asks me if my license has been reinstated. And the, Dr. Kwan, the recently that I've been volunteering, for, um, we had a discussion, maybe uh, I can start like a few days at his office as associates. Like, so private, but maybe not solo, but maybe with, uh, with Dr. Kwan. That's a, that's a possibility we've been discussing. So I mean, anything's open right now. It's not like a, a, I have a plan, like where I'm gonna do, like what type of practice. Not in details, but I wanna start like a slow. And 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 yes, the whole purpose is to be able to treat the patient again. Yes, so I, I'll be practicing. Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cho, I'm now going to ask our board members if they have any questions for you, starting to my right with our president. Okay. Thank you, Judge Larson. Mr. Cho, thank you for being here today. And uh, I want to really commend your rehabilitation efforts. Um, notably, I believe, is that your reference letters, um, not only was there a high quantity of reference letters, but I think something that we rarely see is acknowledgement in each in almost every one of those reference letters that you've had that discussion with those people writing the reference letter. Um, so in my view, um, I think that carries weight. So thank you for including those. Um, I, I, I may have missed it, but I'm wondering what is the name of your business? Um, Clean Lab, K-L-E-E-N. L-A-B. 
In, in the course of uh, clean lab promotion, advertising, et cetera, do you ever reference yourself or imply that you're a licensed doctor? No, uh, no I'm not. I, I'm aware of that, uh, so I was very careful about it. So, and I didn't have to because all my clients are like, uh, I'm not going to the show and promoting or anything. It's, it's just those doctors in, already in relationship with me, so they know about my case and they even wrote a reference letter. So, yeah, I didn't do it. Thank you. Um, can, I, I noticed there was a, a lot of monetary donations and, I, and they were included in the packet. I just wanted to get to hear your impression of how, um, kind of interpret how that it demonstrates rehabilitation. Like, why, why did you include those? Well, How do you think that m might demonstrate your rehabilitation? Um, yeah, the, the, I made a donation not to present it to the board, but it happened to be presented. But it was from, like, a chiropractic mission. I went there six times. It was, I initially, I didn't expect it to be this way. It became kind of like a, like a mission from, from myself and my family. And... So there are a lot of there's much needed. Haiti is one of the being one of the poorest country, and the the of everything was starting there. The birthing center was uh, starting, and the the so um, the orphanage need uh, uh, electricity. So there's much needed. So I made uh, donations like from genuine heart. I'm, I'm not saying it's part of my. I wouldn't say it's part of my rehabilitation effort. I submitted. Okay, I, 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 I'm assuming you you chose to include those and to demonstrate those donations to the board as part of the rehabilitation packet. Yeah, yeah, uh, probably like the way of saying like uh, um, that I'm sorry I caused the society harm, but now I wanted to like rather uh, I want to display that I wanted to like uh, rather give than. Just looking for my personal gains. Maybe, okay. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also noticed that some of those came um, out of business accounts. So I'm wondering if most of those were made through your personal, as a personal donation from you, or were those simply business yeah, write-offs? Yeah. Uh, my my corporation is S Corporation. So. Uh -huh. um, okay. It's, it's basically going out of my okay. my pocket. Yeah. Maybe. Um, yeah, most of the money is at the uh, uh, is in business account. My personal account doesn't have much balance, so com for the convenience, it just go out of there. And then also um, t for the tax purposes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I noted you mentioned you were willing to accept a probationary period should your um, license be reinstated. Of course, yes. And how how many years has it been since you last? Um, actively had your hands on treated a patient almost four years almost four years and so can you tell me do you do you believe that over four years um, you've had any diminished clinical skills yeah um, so I went to one of the adjusting seminar, which I learned from the Cairo mission. The other students are wearing t-shirts. So um, I went there to, uh, for that purpose, like, um, I was interested in that technique too, but it was too basic actually. <laughs> but uh, still, um, I, I'm willing to do it if it's a board require me to do it so I can get back on my feet with the confidence. Thank you. And just one, did you say? You attended one? The adjusting seminar, I just once. And yeah. They have a series of like a, a program. That was the first one. Yeah. But like I said, it was two basic techniques for students. Uh, like a, it was programmed toward the uh, design for the students, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right, Mr. Cho, I just want to remind you to just remember to give a brief pause before you answer the question because there's a little bit of cutting off. Oh, sorry. So okay, that way okay. you make sure you know what uh, question you're answering gotcha. as well. All right, just continue to my right if there's any additional questions from our board members. 
Hi, Mr. Cho. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say I appreciate you saying or acknowledging that, that it's dangerous to be a nice person and unethical at the same time. Um, I am curious, I think I missed it, um, if you could just repeat for me what was going on in your head when you decided to um, do the insurance fraud. You know, you had been practicing for a while apparently without doing that and then something changed for you. Can you just briefly tell me what you were thinking? So, um, are you asking when I was doing the fraudulent insurance billing, what went through in my mind? Yeah, like you weren't doing it, then you decided to, what transpired for you to? Me to do it. Correct. Oh, oh okay, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. last, I got my license in year 2000, like uh, end of year 2000, so I've been in practice for a long time, 16, 18 years, 17 years, but I didn't do personal injury like my first 14, 15 years of my practice. Yeah, um, but like uh, I described this earlier that I had a little mo moment of pause that I went to Korea, work there. I came back and um, start the practice again. And I view as a personal injury as a, like a, a easy route to build a practice. So even if even if uh, I didn't have much heart on it, because the patient doctor patient relationship in PI injury PI uh, clinic is very different than the other side of the clinic because they more they are more like they have a um, patient attorney relationship and I'm I'm there to like provide their needs and then patient doesn't appreciate the the doctor much then compared to the other side of my clinic where like we have a very uh, intimate relationship, doctor-patient relationship and they really, I see their like appreciation, they really like show uh, great, they're very grateful about the service that I provide. But so, and, but I still did a personal injury case even when I didn't have a heart which means that's because of the greed, right? Because if if I don't have a heart, I shouldn't have, I should I shouldn't do it. But I did, so it was already like a, I stepped like into the first step was already wrong, and then uh, my clinic was in Los Angeles. Um, it was there was fierce competitions, um, and the PI cases a lot of um, from the referral from the law offices, which it shouldn't be done, it shouldn't be done in that way, but. That was the case when I was uh, doing it. So, um, and in the beginning, like uh, my bill was very low, that I got complained, uh, and also like uh, some advice, wrong advice, the words going around. The the bill has to be like this amount of a bill is like a good bill. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, it's very bad, embarrassing. So in my mind. I was just complying, complying to the uh, the law offices and try to uh, gain benefit. That was the biggest mistake and problem that went on. Do you ever see yourself in that position again? Me? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't. And I'm. I don't know if it's the. Um, I'm not planning to do the personal injury again. I'm not saying that that's a bad, I was bad. That's, that's needed service, it's good service. But um, but, but anyways, uh, that's not something that I'm very interested in. And I commit uh, those frauds not because uh, I was uh, financially difficult or anything, it was, it was from the, uh, me being unethical and the, from the greed, so I don't see myself ever put it in that position again. It wasn't from like uh, uh, the the need, financial need, or anything like that. So. Okay, thank you so much. I want to stay away from that. Okay, yeah. no further questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Cho, um, or morning. Good morning, morning. Mr. Cho. Um, again. Uh, I would like to also just um, acknowledge your transparency 
in as it is reflected in the letters, um, which it should be, but we don't often see that reflected. Um, you mentioned um, that you are not interested in PI, but do you plan to accept PI or cases again? Like, yeah, if uh, my existing patient, if they happen to have a car injury, car accident, and they want to be treated by, treated by me, yes, I will accept that as a case. But um, it's not like uh, uh, any PI patient, our office is not accepting it. It's not like that. But um, I'm talking in general, general, like uh, in the way I run the PI practice in the past, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I didn't say PI is a bad thing, so I, I didn't try to uh, give any impression that that's my view. No, it's not. So, so it seems, or it seems that you uh, suggested that you started doing PI after being away f in Korea and coming back and starting a practice or starting to build your practice. Am I yeah. correct in correct. that interpretation? Yes. Um, given that you haven't practiced and you'll be starting all over again, um, you said that it, you, you began to do PI because it was difficult starting, oh, getting started. Oh, yeah. What will you do when you run into that difficulty again as if you are given your license and you're starting over? Yeah, um, I said that I went to Korea and come back and start the practice. But I didn't say it was difficult time. Financially, it wasn't difficult. It was just uh, I was looking for easy route to uh, to grow the business. Mm -hmm. That's from the greed. So it's a little different. I, then financial difficulties. Before I went to Korea, like a year 2008, when we have a financial crisis, like uh, I, I had a bad time at the at the moment, and um, my my family, my wife, um, I took care of them. My my wife admit that, our f because of the financial uh, difficulty, it's not that our families fall apart, but we were like more strong. Our family is bond more stronger than ever before, and she appreciate that, and she always say that. Um, that was the best time of our like marriage. That not that she wants to go back to the time, but like uh, for relationship wise. So the financial difficulties. I think I can live rich. I can live poor. Uh, so I, maybe I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you misunderstood me. I didn't imply that it was just financial difficulty, but difficulty starting a practice oh. again. Oh, yeah. So oh, that okay. being said, difficulty getting patients or starting a practice is what I heard you say earlier, is that correct? Yes, that it was the reason? So given that you would be starting all over, my question to you is, how will you overcome that difficulty without falling back into those old habits? I see, yeah. Um, I have a plan to slow my practice, like uh, slowly, like uh, start it, slowly build it, like a few days out of the week, maybe associate with the uh, Dr. Kwan or other doctors, uh, my wholesale business. I don't know. If it, uh, my wholesale business is is already there, and then. But I'm purely like want the license reinstated to be able to say things that I wasn't able to say and do things that I wasn't able to do, which is like a, a helping people. I, I'm not viewing this license as a, a tool to make a living or. The growing the practice, starting the practice is, isn't the only um, the agenda, the only thing that I have to accomplish. And my, my life, livelihood does not depend on it right now. So uh, I don't know if it's assurance, but yes, I, I'm planning to uh, do it slowly. I don't want to grow it fast. So. OK. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's reflected on BCE. Um, stamp uh, 07. At the top, you speak about Ms. Torres providing you with tools, and without divulging any per personal confidential information that you discuss with your therapist, what tools 
can you talk about today that you have that you can put in place when given the situation where um, you might be tempted or, or you might prevent yourself from falling back into getting involved with unethical people or unethical behavior? Um, so, the, the, you mean the EMDR uh, therapy? The, the therapy, the, or in general, the counseling that I had with her? So what I mean is you uh -huh. spoke um, on the third, the first paragraph, uh -huh. the third ten cent sentence, um, I mean, third line from the bottom, it says, Miss Torres provided me with tools and coping mechanisms necessary to ensure that they are not repeated in the oh. future. So what tools? Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, yes. I was, um, I thought, well, you're, you're talking about, like, any therapy tools no, or, no, 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 I got it, I got it, yes. So, yes, um, the, the initial intention was to, the counseling therapy, right? I wanted to, like, hold myself together, not losing it, but um, I, I had a lot of uh, discussion. We had a lot of talking about my cases, and she and I, it was my first time, came up with a, openly discuss this matter and during our conversation it come to realization how how bad it is how unethical it is. Up, up to this point I probably like uh, I was still okay that my case is already dismissed at the criminal court and but it really like revealed myself that um, how horrible I was, the, and uh, yeah, first time I, I, you know, sometimes you just roughly think about it, but never like went into really details and then dissect it. But I was able to do it, and I realized how problematic that was. So I see back in time, I cannot imagine myself like uh, back in time doing the things, doing the same thing again. It's too horrified to see me in that position again. So that would be the uh, the most benefit that I got with her therapy. Not she she didn't discuss like uh, it's okay things could happen. You you're a good person. It's not that kind of therapy. It wasn't like that. So it was more of like a, a discussion with a, like a pastor. Like like so we went into the details. Of, how bad I was, and those kind of um, the counseling that helped me, like really uh, objectively looking at myself. Okay. Um, and I think that this might be my last question. Um, looking at BCE stamp 12, the letter from uh, Mr. Chang. Yeah. He talks about building several websites um, for you to provide essential health information to the public. Can you give me just a very brief synopsis of what's on those websites and how are you referred to in those websites? No, um, he means the he means my Instagram page and also. Um, uh, also, my Facebook and the YouTube, he managed those uh, platforms. And how are you referred to uh, on those um, as, how are you addressed or how are you introduced? Oh, yeah, um, Joshua Cho, health, uh, he used to be health sniper, <laughs> health sniper, <laughs> and uh, um, before it was, uh, it was uh, Joshua Cho DC, but uh, we removed that. So it was a health sniper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he put this letter um, to be, uh, try to help me that I'm benefiting the public with a good like health information. But he's actually doing the, uh, most of the, our website for the wholesale of the supplements to the doctors, like the shopping carts and 
So, yeah, it's basically it's mostly that what he does. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, and to my left. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Cho. I also want to echo the, the, uh, the detail and the uh, voluminous information you provided for us in your, uh, in your packet. It's, uh, it's a tribute to, I think, your rehabilitation and your seriousness about uh, this process. And I think that reflects in your, in your paperwork. Um, I really don't have a question other than um, more of a comment, I guess, um, because I think the questions have been great. And that is, when you talked about telling your children, that was heart-wrenching for me. And um, I, felt, I felt that. Um, I have three children. And to, to do what you've done, and then to be as transparent and direct and open with your family, your friends, your colleagues, says a lot about, in my opinion, your rehabilitation. But telling your kids is huge. And uh, the fact that you've opened yourself to them, that you want to be an example to them, um, I think that's a tribute to your, to your. Um. So, having said that, the questions have been asked about, because our, our position is the assurance sure. that the public is safe for you to enter into practice. Right. And so, you're, you said eloquently earlier that it, words, saying it is one thing, but doing it is another. And saying it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's our hope that it won't happen, and I'm certain that it's your hope that it won't happen. But I hope that you'll reflect on the fact that you would never want to go through no. that painstaking process again. And I think that's hopefully the assurance that we can take and that you can take, that if you are given your license back and you go through the probationary process, um, that you'll remember that. That's all I have. I don't have any further questions. Uh, I appreciate that <clears throat> there was a differenti differentiation you made, or at least that I was starting to hear, um, between being a nice person versus a compliant person. Uh, and I was saying silence compliance is definitely not the same as, you know, ethical business owner, licensee, community member, et cetera. And I understand that you want to start slow. Um, possibly even just begin as an associate, right, and kind of work your way in, in terms of in the event uh, your license is reinstated. A uh, question I have is what processes or expectations, right, just kind of in that hypothetical, would you set up, whether it be with your staff or associates, um, when, either when it came to billing responsibilities, referral situations, and I guess what I'm alluding to is what is the difference in your personal criteria that you would consider for kind of when faced with this, and I know kind of it was kind of touched on a little bit in an earlier question, but I'm interested to know what, what difference in criteria do you see yourself putting in place among yourself and your associates? Um, different criteria. Uh, when you receive uh, uh -huh. referrals in the future. Yeah. To your point, you can't, you can't just ignore the referrals. They're going right, to happen. Right, right, right. Yeah, I didn't think that far. <laughs> and that's fair, and I, I hear yeah, you. Uh, yeah, so, um, if I, um, I feel like I'm going to be a very careful person. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, I, I totally respect the, uh, the system. So and of course, I don't want to like uh, offend them or make them feel bad, but in a night, there's a lot, many nice way that I can put it, make make myself like a straight, and I think I can do that. I already did with my employees at work, so mm -hmm. there's um, uh, I'm a nice person. I can buy them lunch, but then there's certain things I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I should I should have like a moral standard and the ethic, and I stick to it. I that's the only answer. I can't even imagine myself being there yet, so I, I didn't really prepare that answer. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Nothing further from our board members. All right. Anything further? Any follow-up uh, questions for Mr. Show? No, not questions. All right then. Then it is time to give closing remarks because petitioner has the burden of proof. I will allow Ms. Johnson to give her closing remarks first.
As Your Honor and the Board certainly know and, and has been addressed today, the purpose of these proceedings is to protect the public, to ensure that an individual who holds a license is not only knowledgeable and capable of holding that license, but also is going to use that license in the way that it's intended to do, which is to make sure that the public receives only a benefit and certainly no harm. Case law has told us this, but perhaps more importantly, just common sense has told us this. And perhaps it should be common sense. Certainly, we would hope so with our licensees, and certainly, as has been addressed at length today, in the past, <coughs> I apologize, in the past, in this case, it wasn't employed. But the purpose of reinstatement hearings is also not to punish someone who has harmed in the past. Certainly, we've already done that through the revocation of the license, but to see whether or not that person has rehabilitated such that they are once again deserving of the license and can be trusted of the license. It's not an easy task, I recognize that, and it's not a task that I would particularly want to undertake. Fortunately, the board has laid out a criteria of rehabilitation to serve not as a checklist if you check every box you get the license back, but as a guideline. And in this case, it is at least in our opinion, that petitioner has worked diligently through these different criteria and by adding his own in order to hopefully demonstrate to the board that the rehabilitation that he is advocating for can be seen not only on a personal level but on a board level as well. We can look at, of course, the nature and severity of the issues and certainly they were voluminous. It's something the board obviously understands but I think perhaps more importantly it's something petitioner understands. He is, at least in my opinion and hopefully yours as well, able to articulate for the board what he did wrong in the past. And that is critical in order to ensure that he will not repeat it again moving forward. Perhaps he doesn't know the specific steps he's going to take when instituting his new practice, but he knows what steps he cannot take. And he knows, equally important, where those guidelines are and how to stay within them. To ensure that way when he is treating patients, if allowed to treat patients again, that he knows where the lines are. If he has a patient that is already established with his practice and gets a personal injury issue, he knows that he can treat them, but also knows exactly how to bill, how to treat, how to counsel. It's when addressing the nature and severity of the actions and equally important, the growth from those severity and actions that we see perhaps the greatest change in petitioner. But we can turn to the other criteria as well. It's his attitude towards his commission of the violations, certainly, but it's his demonstrated rehabilitation efforts. It's his efforts to maintain and update his professional skills through continuing education courses. While he started with the first part of the adjustment seminar, that's not the only continuing education that Petitioner took. We can see his continuing education in his packet and we can hear it through his discussions of staying in contact with the spirit and the idea of chiropractic. Um, licensees, but also with just the idea of what is changing in medicine. It's why he's going on these missions, perhaps, I certainly do not want to put words in his mouth, and doing construction work there. It's why he's going and doing other sorts of efforts, but still being in the near vicinity of being able to read the t-shirts, of going to the seminars, of meeting the students, and it's of meeting these providers who are doing things ethically that are allowing him to see the mentorship which is supplemental to the community service and the continuing education. His service to community groups is more widespread, though, than just the idea of helping in a chiropractic mission. As he's discussed, he's volunteering at food banks. He volunteers with his church. He gives financial donations not to try to buy off or to do anything like that, but when looking at who he was in 2018, somebody who operated under greed, and to now see that somebody who is instead willing to give what he obtains, whether that be financially or whether that be through his own endeavors, shows a difference in mindset. It shows a difference in what is most important to him and how he can share that with the public instead of harming the public. We see through the use of appropriate professional medical or psychiatric treatment that he certainly was not court or board obligated to go to therapy. This was something that he realized he needed because he realized there was a problem and he couldn't identify the problem. 
So he sought the assistance of somebody who could help him with that, who could give him those tools, who could give him those, I believe, as he used, coping mechanisms in order to identify and self-correct, not just at the time, but certainly moving forward. It's in that sense that we can look at the date that these rehabilitation efforts started. As this board is aware, he, petitioner could have petitioned for reinstatement at the two-year mark. He did not. He waited until he had what he believed was a comprehensive petition to submit to the board, not simply taking the easy or the quick route, as perhaps he might have in the past with his practice, but really putting thought, effort, and his own view on the matter before turning it in. And it's that length, that time, and as the board points out in its criteria, that expense associated with putting all of this together, that is something that hopefully weighs in rehabilitation. Perhaps the second most important part, the first of course being the change in attitude that I believe he has discussed at length in his testimony, and I, I certainly do not want to um, take away from that in any way, shape, or form though, is, was as mentioned, the letters of reference in this case. The letters of reference are not only voluminous, but as mentioned, they repeatedly over and over again talk about their knowledge of the situation. And that is important in several ways. One though being the transparency, the accountability. Somebody who holds themselves accountable to their colleagues, to their professionals, to their family, to their children. This is somebody who, if they were to reoffend in the future, would have to go back to those people at every level of their life personal and professional, and once again explain that they messed up. That's a level of accountability and that's a level of transparency that we should hope for because it gives us that reassurance of not only have they made promises to themselves and to the board, but they've made promises to people that they are going to see in their everyday life moving forward. And that is a particular level of transparency. We see it also in case law. Preston versus State Bar of California tells us in reaching a fair conclusion on the question of reformation, the favorable testimony of acquaintances, neighbors, friends, and associates with reference to their observation of the daily conduct and mode of living of an attorney, that case, a State Bar case, who has suffered disbarment should weigh heavily in the scales of justice. And it makes sense for the exact reasons just articulated. But also it makes sense because as pointed out there, it's the daily living. It's one thing for petitioner to come here today and give all of the answers that perhaps he thinks are the best answers. But it's more important when we see it in the everyday observations of those who see him daily in the letter, who can tell you that this isn't simply lip service that's being offered to the board, but it's how he actually lives his life. While we certainly know that there's no guarantee for anyone moving forward, whether or not they will ever reoffend re in the future, we at least have some guarantee here through the rehabilitation that lessons have been learned, and we have some guarantee through the mechanism set up and identified and addressed that there is a plan in place to make sure they will not be repeated, and there are consequences, not only of course the revocation, but the personal consequences that come from that down the line. And if that is not enough, then certainly, as has been addressed and testified to, Petitioner is willing to accept any probation that this board deems necessary for its oversight and monitoring so that he can prove to the board that this is not merely something that he is telling in order to gain something. It's something he's asking for, it's something that he respects, and it's something that he is willing to do anything in order to demonstrate that that respect will continue for the rest of his career. And so for those reasons, we respectfully ask that the license be reinstated on whatever terms the board deems necessary. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Crawford. Any closing remarks? No, Your Honor, thank you. Is the matter submitted? Yes. Ms. Johnson, matter submitted? Yes, thank you. Matter submitted, and the record is closed. We are off the record. All right, thank you. Well, you are free to go, except for I believe Ms. Crawford will be staying with us. Yes. yes. All right. Um, thank you. Do you want to take a break in between the next one? Like a five minute? Or? Yeah. Go ahead, I'll take a break. Okay, we're going to resume in five minutes. We're going to take a quick five-minute break and resume in five. Over to Judge Larson. All right, we are on the record.
Good morning. We are on the record. It is April 22nd, 2022, in the matter of the petition for a reinstatement of surrendered license by Mark Anthony Stoller. This matter is being heard before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. Case number 2022-031050. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings presiding over the matter this morning uh, with the board members. I will ask the board members, starting with our president to the right, to please identify themselves for the record. Dr. David Paris. Dr. Pamela Daniels. Dr. Dion McLean. Dr. Lawrence Adams. Raphael Sweet. Jeanette Cruz. All right, there is a quorum present. And would the Deputy Attorney General please state her appearance for the record? Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General. And Mr. Solar, would you just please announce yourself as well? Mark Solar. All right, just a little closer to Mark Solar. There we go, excellent. All right, we're here this morning because, Mr. Solar, you filed a petition for reinstatement of your license. The board uh, is concerned about the rehabilitation efforts that you have gone through since you surrendered your license. The way that the hearing will proceed is that Ms. Crawford, who represents the people in this matter, will provide a brief overview of the history of the discipline of your license. She will also identify the exhibits that, uh, that represent the petition package. Um, as to those exhibits, I'll ask if you have any objection to any of those exhibits. And then after she is done presenting the overview and the exhibits, you will then have an opportunity to present your case. I will swear you in. Uh, and you can provide testimony to the board members with regards to the rehabilitation efforts you've undertaken. I know that you submitted two additional letters, so we'll mark those as well, and you can provide any testimony about those. After you have provided testimony, Ms. Crawford may question you. And then I will also then ask the board members if they have any questions for you as well. Uh, after all of the evidence has been presented, Ms. Crawford uh, and you will both have an opportunity to give closing remarks if you wish. And then the matter will be submitted to the board. You will not receive a decision today. The board will be going into closed se session to deliberate. And then you will re receive a decision sometime in the future. All right. Um, during this proceeding, I cannot provide any legal advice, but if anyone has any questions about the procedures, please let me know, and if I can answer the question, I will. All right? Yes? Yes. All right, just a couple of reminders. We have a court reporter here who is also taking down everything that's being said during the hearing, so it's very important that you keep your voice up and that you answer audibly. She can't take down nods of the head, so even though we can see nods of the head, we need to make sure we have a clear record as well. So if anyone if anyone forgets, I'll gently remind you. All right, Ms. Crawford, uh, please begin. Thank you. As with the prior petition, I am appearing on behalf of the Attorney General's pursuant government code section 11522 in, a, in an assisted role for fact finding, not an adversarial role. And I am here to ensure that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision. The petitioner was issued a doctor of chiropractic license on May 7, 1999. An accusation was filed on January 17, 2012. And the board adopted a stipulated surrender revoking the petitioner's license, effective May 11, 2013. The circumstances underlying the accusation were that on March 16th of 2010, the petitioner was convicted on his guilty plea of unlawfully receiving rebates for patient referrals. The petitioner was placed on three years probation, ordered to com complete 450 Caltrans hours and pay restitution in the amount of $65,000 to insurance companies that he had defrauded. The accusation charged the petitioner with conviction of a substantially related crime, conviction of a crime of dishonesty or corruption, committing dishonest or corrupt acts, participating in acts involving fraud and a scheme to defraud insurance companies, employing or using a capper 
to obtain business as part of a scheme to defraud insurance companies, offering or accepting rebates for patient referrals, making false statements in a document relating to the practice of chiropractic, and preparing a document with the intent to use it in support of a false claim. The conviction arose out of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Investigation Bureau conducting an investigation between June 2006 to June 2007, which revealed that Petitioner participated in a large fraud ring that organized staged vehicle accidents to defraud insurance companies of hundreds of thousands of dollars. The fraud ring consisted of phony claimants who were involved in the staged collisions, cappers who provided referrals to service to, to several dishonest lawyers, automobile body shops who worked on the damaged vehicles, and a small group of chiropractors who purportedly treated the phony claimants. In October of 2009, a group of 28 defendants, including the petitioner, were named in a felony complaint for an arrest warrant filed in the Superior Court in the County of Los Angeles. As part of the scheme, the petitioner would meet with phony claimants for one or two chiropractic sessions and provide minimal treatment. The petitioner would then bill and seek reimbursement from insurance companies for numerous treatment sessions and services that were never performed or rendered. The petitioner has complied with the terms of his criminal case, which has since been dismissed. He has complied with the board's recovery cost recovery order as well as complied with the continuing education requirements during the time his license was revoked. It has been nine years since the, the petitioner's license was revoked. The first exhibit, Your Honor, that we'd like to introduce is the petitioner's application for reinstatement of his, surrender, of his surrendered license along with the attachments in support of his application. And we would like to mark that as Exhibit 1 and introduce it at this time. All right. Any, uh, Mr. Stoller, any objection to Exhibit 1? No objection. Exhibit 1 is admitted. Exhibit 2 is the certified copy of the petitioner's prior disciplinary documents that we would like to mark and introduce at this time. And that's Exhibit 2, correct, Counsel? Yes. Any objection? No. Exhibit 2 is admitted. And Exhibit 3 contains a copy of the notice of hearing for today's hearing date that we would like marked as Exhibit 3 and introduced. Any objection? No. Exhibit 3 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't have any additional information to present. Uh, all right. Before I swear in, Mr. Stoller, um, I want to mark as Exhibit A the two additional letters that, that Mr. Stoller provided. There's just the two, correct? Correct. Any objection, Ms. Crawford? No, Your Honor. Exhibit A is admitted. All right, Mr. Stoller, now is your opportunity to testify. If you'd please stand, I will swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please have a seat. And please state and spell your name for the record. Mark Stoller, M-A-R-K-S-T-O-L-Y-A-R. -A All right, just a few reminders. Um, just remember to keep your voice up and speak a little more slowly than you probably are uh, used to speaking, and that just makes it, it uh, makes it easier for us to hear you. It makes it easier for our court reporter to make sure she's getting down everything that's being said. All right. Okay. All right. You may begin. Um, so. So this is your opportunity to share with the board all of the efforts that you've undertaken since um, your license, since you surrendered your license. Okay. Um, if there's information in your petition pack package that you want to highlight for the board members, you can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, this is your opportunity to provide the board members any information that you want them to consider for purposes of issuing a decision okay. concerning your petition. And also, so you understand, and I'll mention this again, after you provide your testimony, I will ask Ms. Crawford if she has any questions for you, and then the board members will also have an opportunity to ask you questions. And then, of course, sometimes that will remind you of other things that okay. you want to share. I will make sure that you have another opportunity before we finish to provide any additional testimony. All right? Thank you. I All don't right. have a prepared speech, so I'm just going to... That's fine. Kind of, kind of wing it. So, okay. um, you already got, you know, 
the information about the case that unfortunately I was involved in, uh, which is very, um, it's very embarrassing and uh, difficult thing to um, to come to terms with, and uh, I um, since then I got into the Pilates field, and I've I've um, been helping people using my chiropractic knowledge, but using uh, Pilates as a, a tool to help people, to continue to help people. And um, as mentioned, I've been, I, I took a lot of uh, chiropractic um, continuing education classes, uh, studied on my own in, in terms of uh, books and, and keeping up with journals, and uh, did a lot of self-reflection and um, I would say probably uh, went through a transformation, a major transformation uh, as a person and a human being uh, through a lot of um, humbling uh, times and uh, hitting rock bottom for sure uh, in terms of my, um, um, how I felt about myself and uh, my life and just went through a lot of self-reflection and grew as a person and um, went through a lot of stages of, of you know, uh, the mental process of it, like anger, denial, grief. And uh, I feel that um, I've matured in the process and um, in terms of uh, rehabilitation and uh, you know like I've done a lot of self-reflection and I feel that um, I understand uh, that I acted out of character that I'm you know I've always been an ethical person and uh, unfortunately um, I got involved with um, the wrong people and worked for the wrong people and uh, was negligent and naive and negligent and uh, weak and didn't, wasn't strong in character and so um, I feel that uh, those are some of the things that I've had to deal with and grow as a person and, and to the point where I felt like okay now I wanted my license back because I felt like I, I, I got into the profession to help people. And I got into the profession because I had my own back problems and I was a teenager. I got into chiropractic to help people and I just felt like um, when, when all this went on, I just felt like, you know, all this happened, all this, all this happened and it, it sort of went against the whole purpose of uh, helping people. And now I feel like I, through Pilates, I've been helping people, and it feels really good, and that's always what made me feel good, is to help people. And I just want to, now I just want to get my license back so I can use chiropractic with my Pilates clients and uh, continue to help people using chiropractic. I don't know if that's enough. So how about this? We'll ask Ms. Crawford if she has any questions for you, and then the board members, and then again, I'll, re I'll allow you to provide anything further. Ms. Crawford, cross-examination? Thank you. Good morning. What was um, the impetus, if you can recall, for how your practice took a turn and the conduct that you were, co were convicted of occurred? Um, I started working for um, this chiropractor, and uh, I'm not sure if I should say any names, so I'm, I'm not, unless you tell me to. And um, I just, uh, they hired me just to um, adjust client, you know, patients and, and do physiotherapy and um, I started doing that and uh, 
the chiropractor had an office in Hollywood, and he told me I, you know, needed a chiropractor in there, and um, I went over there and um, basically, you know, started working there, and um, I, I just um, was sort of pressured into um, doing things that were unethical and I was just too weak. And basically I was told that, you know, if I don't do it, then I'm going to lose my job. So I was just weak and uh, did things I shouldn't have done. And I regret it. So this didn't happen when you had your own private practice. It was while you were working for somebody else. Um, so I never really had my own private practice, uh, but the I was um, kind of pressured to, in a way, put the practice on my name, I guess, or take the the cases on my name. But I was never. It was never my practice, and I was just there treating the the patients. Did you have to um, pay rent for the space where you were treating patients? I was put in a position where um, I, I had to take care of the business like, like it's my own. Was the owner of the business present? Uh, initially, I was uh, in his practice in uh, Sherman Oaks, mm -hmm. and he was present. And then when he sent me to go work in Hollywood, he was not present. And was the name of the practice under your name as well? Um, it was the name that he that he uh, created. And Did it I just took it over, I guess. I don't okay. know. I took over the rent, and I was signing the the paperwork. Was your name included in the name that the owner had created? I don't think so. How did you start your Pilates practice after your license revocation? So um, I um, always wanted to do it, and um, so um, I decided to go get certified, and I'd been studying it for a while, and then um, pretty much I was in the mind frame of never working, uh, never having partners again, or or working for anyone, so I started with my father. And so my father um, invested some money, and we opened a Pilates studio. Okay. When, was, when did you open your Pilates studio? Um, I don't recall the exact date, but sometime maybe 2012, 2012, 2013 maybe. Was it before your license was revoked? It was around, the, right before, it was around the time that my they contacted me and said that they wanted to have a hearing okay. regarding licensing. And um, I had already, I think, opened the studio by then, but I wasn't practicing already. And is that the only uh, paid work that you've done since your license was revoked? Yes. Have you um, had any counseling around the issues that are in the accusation? I did a few sessions with the counselor, but I uh, couldn't really afford it. So I didn't have that much um, counseling. Uh, so I just did a lot of uh, reading um, in terms of uh, counseling, like, you know, um, understanding myself, and I actually um, took a lot of classes. I actually got it. Um, I haven't finished the program, but um, I got in a master's program for clinical counseling. So I took a lot of classes uh, at a master's level, and because I I took those classes, it kind of helped me to analyze myself and understand myself better. So I feel like I sort of. Uh, done a lot of self-reflection and, and reading and 
analyze myself. Why did you um, enter into that program? Um, well, for one, it's almost like a therapeutic for me. Um, and I just feel like understanding uh, psychology and counseling is good for everyone. And why had you sought out counseling for the few sessions that you were able to afford it? Um, I was very stressed out. I went through a really rough time. And um, I was just very, you know, not like clinically depressed or anything, but I was, I was in a bad spot. So is there anything that you learned either through counseling or through your program that you can share about what you've learned and the insight you've gained into your actions? Well, uh, yeah, for one thing, I, I, I can say in terms of insight, when I came out of school, I was, my goal was to always just help people and be as ethical as possible. And then, um, you know, my, I don't know, disappointment or desperation or whatever it is that made me kind of broke me uh, that, that I would go and, and and allow myself to be put in that position where I, I did the unethical things that I did I felt like um, sort of like I found myself again the person that was like uh, super ethical and would never do anything unethical, regard, regardless of the circumstances, I felt like I was able to sort of find myself again. Um, and also to understand uh, wh what was going through my mind. Why, would, why, why did I have no confidence or, or why was I weak and why did I allow myself to do unethical things that be, you know, un sort of like under somebody's thumb and uh, allow myself to be swayed in a negative way. I, I feel like I've, I've, under, I've understood that. So do you have any tools around how to handle those situations or identify when you're feeling that way? Definitely. I mean, you know, my, my red flag goes on. I've, I've gotten rid of every... I felt like I, I was surrounded by a lot of users and a lot of unethical people. And I've gotten rid of, you know, I like swept house and got rid of any person in my life who I thought was negative, unethical, or, um, you know, user in any way, and just sort of try to be around only positive people, you know. So. And who are the people that are in your support network? Well, definitely my, my wife. My, my, I was married to, to I was uh, divorced right after the whole uh, negative situation that I went through, the legal situation. Mm -hmm. So I've uh, remarried and my wife is uh, very supportive. And uh, in every way. Um, and just the people that you know, the new friends that I've made and surrounded myself with, they're all very hardworking, ethical, um, supportive people who are very inspiring. And very different from the people that I was around before. And if you were to be in a similar situation where you might be around people that um, aren't the best for your continued ethical behavior. How would you deal with those situations? So, uh, first of all, I wouldn't be in that situation because uh, I'm. I just uh, my red flag goes on, and I just you know, if I feel something's not right, I just won't be in that situation. I know that 100%. Um, and uh, I just feel like I've, I've learned how to navigate around people better. I just, you know, um, and I just don't allow myself to get used anymore. That's it. Whereas before, I just allowed constantly as like a, kind of like a weird people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And sort of just allowed myself to constantly get 
uh, used. Why did you wait almost 10 years to seek your re your a reinstatement of your license? So, there's a lot of things, and that's part of uh, the, the transformation that I was talking about. I just felt, at first, very um, frustrated. Um, it's even frustrating for me, you know, when I hear the details of the case that you mentioned, um, it's just very painful. It was very painful for me to when I saw the big picture of what was going on, because I was sort of tunnel vision, I, I did unethical things and signed papers I shouldn't have signed, but I didn't understand the scope of this whole uh, thing that happened. So it was very devastating for me when I realized what I was in, inadvertently a part of, even though um, I didn't, I was kind of just focused on my own thing. Um, so it was really hard for me to feel um, the courage or the strength to come in front of a board and I just felt so embarrassed. I felt so, like I acted so much like out of character and I knew I was going to look bad and I, and I felt like no matter what I'm going to say it's going to sound like I'm making excuses. And so it took me a while to feel strong enough and confident enough to, to come in and present myself and also to feel like um, good enough about myself where I feel like I, I should have a license back and um, get a second chance, maybe. And why do you feel like you should have your license back? Well, um, I feel like I was a good chiropractor. I was always uh, good with my hands and adjusting people and, um, and also I uh, felt like I had uh, I wanted to help people, and so I felt like I had those. Those are good things to have, and uh, now I have Pilates, which which has uh, been an amazing tool for me to help people, and uh, I just feel like uh, I want to help my clients using Pilates, uh, chiropractic, which I can't use, and I feel like I'll be able to help more people. So I feel like it's gonna. I'm gonna be able to help people and. Um, also, I feel like I need it in a way, uh, I feel like I want my license back. I feel like, um, I just feel, even though the record got expunged and everything, I just feel incomplete, like a failure, having a revoked license and having to tell people, um, yeah, I don't have a license. I surrendered my license. I, I had some, you know, issue turned into a mess and I have to explain everything. And I just feel like, um, I don't know, I just feel like I want to have my license back and, and sort of, I worked for it. I worked hard and I was a good student and I felt like I had the right um, mentality going in just to wanting to help people. So I feel like I want, I want the license back so I can be part of the profession again. So if your license is reinstated, what do you plan to do with that license? Well, um, I'm not going to, I don't want to change much. I just want to put a chiropractic table in my, in my uh, Pilates studio. And um, if my clients uh, need chiropractic, I just want to be able to provide chiropractic for them. And you'd need to, um, would you... Would you accept insurance, or would this be on a cash basis? I don't want to accept insurance ever again. Okay. And I, I've never built insurance before myself. I, that was one of my problems also is uh, I, I don't know if I was lazy or if I was just um, didn't have the knowledge. I never, I always felt frustrated billing insurance, and I just, that was one of my problems why I even maybe got involved with other people. Because I just wanted to, I just wanted to treat the patients, and insurance seemed kind of, uh, at the time, overwhelming and uh, kind of uh, c confusing to me and frustrating, and I just didn't want to deal with insurance. And I mean, I still kind of feel that way. So I, I only want to do like a cash practice. 
With the courses that you have taken, have you taken any courses in um, billing that would help you understand how to bill insurance companies if the time comes that you choose to take insurance? Definitely. Um, I took some really good courses and also um, the, the gentleman that uh, runs those courses, he has this whole website that has a lot of chiropractors. I didn't know about this. I wish I would have known back then. A lot of chiropractors who are willing to help you with your adjusting, uh, help you with your bill, you know, teach you how to bill properly, and uh, great. I found a great resource, um, which I'm planning to utilize. I took a lot of um, lessons from, from those classes. So on top of the fact that I learned a lot f from the billing, and lear you know, learned that I just have to not be kind of, if I, if I was to ever do it, which I don't plan to, you just have to be really on top of it, and, and you can't be lazy. You have to know about billing. And it's a whole other side of uh, being a chiropractor, I guess, um, which I never uh, learned and I never uh, wanted to get involved in, um, which makes it paradoxical what happened. It's very, you know, makes it even m more strange what happened. But I never really wanted to bill insurance. All I wanted to do was... Um, treat patients and make people feel better. That's it. I'm not sure if that answers the question. It does. What, what assurances can you give this board that if they were to reinstate your license, that these circumstances would not happen in the future? I'm, I would never get involved with anybody again, first of all. Um, it's just going to be me um, in terms of uh, treating, uh, having practice. It's only going to be me. I'm not going to ever get involved with anybody else. And um, sorry, I didn't know if I'm sh I should look around or if I should just look at you because I'm talking to you. Sorry, I'm not trying to ignore anybody. Um, yeah, I just, uh, if I. I just would never do anything unethical. I mean, I just got burned like crazy. So, and I know I got burned and I acted out of character and that's what happened to me. And so I would just never be in that situation again. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. All right, I'm now going to ask our board members if they have any questions, starting to my right with our president. Thank you, Judge Larson. Uh, Mr. Stoll, is, is it pronounced Stoller? Stoller. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, and a couple of them you answered here, so let me go through this. Um, my first question is just a clarification. On your petition for reinstatement, um, there is a checkbox checkbox answer that says, "Have you ever had disciplinary action taken against any professional license in this state or any other state?" You checked yes, um, and I'm assuming that was because of this matter. Has there been any other? No. Okay, never. and in no other state. Never. Okay. Anything. This is the only thing that ever. And your. My calculation was um, you have not practiced in approximately 10 years, if we include the year of 2013. And I, I just want to take kind of hear from you as to what your thoughts are on if your skills may have diminished over the last decade, um, and if so, which what skills might those be? So uh, obviously, I can I haven't adjusted people. So, but I feel like I have a natural uh, knack uh, where it's going to come back, kind of like muscle memory. Um, and it, I just feel like I need to brush up on it, obviously. Um, but there's a resource, like I mentioned, um, the, chi the chiropractic seminars, some of them that I took, there's a resource there where they allow, they will, there's doctors that will volunteer to help you uh, with the setups and and help you with the adjustments, which I, I need to obviously practice chiropractic setups for adjustments and also brush up on other 
chiropractic skills, which I still, you know, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm planning to do. Um, I haven't adjusted anybody. Um, you know, I stretch people sometimes. I, for Pilates, I, I. Sometimes I'll, um, you know, look at their range of motion, and I just don't adjust people. But I feel like I've, it, it just will come back to me because I felt like I, I started chiropractic very young, and I just felt like it became adjusting became kind of kind of intuitive for me. And do you feel that the brushing up, the revisiting that, those manual therapy skills, the adjustment skills would uh, prepare you to be safer as a chiropractor? In, if you were to return to practice? Safer in a physical way, like not hurting somebody? Yeah. I definitely, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very gentle when I adjust, so I definitely never have hurt anybody before. And I feel like I'm not going to hurt anybody so, because I'm a very... Uh, and a gentle adjuster, so but definitely I still need to brush up and practice setups, and um, but I don't feel like I'm I've I've hurt anybody ever before physically or uh, will ever. Thank you. How many total CE hours did you submit to us? Um, I don't remember offhand. Uh, it it was, looked like a lot of twelve-hour days. It was a lot. It was a lot. It was both online and live. I noted just a couple examples on 725-2020, uh, 721-2020, and 1010-2020. There was uh, Ethics and Law CE by the same CE provider with the same titling, um, either practical or PI. And I was just wondering, and, and I'm just to point those out, I don't want to get into deep, but I'm just wondering if you give us a sense as to how much of the CE you did submit was uh, repeat courses. So um, they look similar, but there, there's, I was very careful because the, the seminar, they offered a lot of different variations. So I was very careful to try to pick different ones. Uh, there may have been a few similar ones, but I was very careful and I tried to pick different topics like, uh, in, but they, some of them were similar sounding or they were different instructors sometimes. Okay, so those would have been the more rare examples yeah, if they were definitely. repeated. Yeah, definitely. I tried to, I tried, didn't want to keep doing the same thing. I tried to vary it um, in terms of okay. education. And um, you would be willing to, um, if we were to reinstate your license, you would be willing to accept probationary terms? Whatever it takes. Um, and my last question is, I, I want to get a sense of your mindset. I was hearing um, things like it was confusing and I got burned. And I'm just wondering if, if you could describe kind of your understanding of your responsibilities as a licensee um, today, uh, I'm, I, I think I'm hearing that you weren't very aware of your responsibilities when, well, I'm assuming the billing was going out under your license number and your name. Yes. So, um, so how has that changed now, your understanding of those responsibilities? Well, I just realized I have to, well, first of all, I'm not planning to bill insurance, but obviously if the board grants me my license, they have to make sure I, I'll have the right to. So the board has to, I understand the board has to um, feel like I'll, I'm going to do things the right way. And I just would never, you know, I would never work with anybody again or uh, do anything unethical again. It's just out of, it, this whole situation was out of my character. And so I feel like it's so out of my character that I just feel like I can't, I can't even believe that, that I did that or that I, you know, did something unethical. So I just feel like it's not in my character to do something unethical. And I realize that billing is, is um, I have to do it exactly the right way. And, you know, if anything, I have to, you know, go over everything with a fine tooth comb and and just make sure everything's done perfectly. And on top of that, I would never want to accidentally do something wrong and then 
have something else happen if, if I was to get my license, because that would be devastating, because I went through this whole mess, and I would never, it, it was horrible. I mean, it was a horrible situation that I would never want to experience again. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. It, whatever your answer is answers my question. Yeah, thank you very well, by the way. Thank you. So I think what I'm trying to, I, I want to give you an opportunity. Be, I, I think what I'm trying to understand is your, your mindset today in reflecting back. If you still feel like you got burned, and in my mind, i.e., something was done to you, um, versus your personal responsibility um, to not allow that to be done to you. I totally accept that it's my fault. Whatever, whatever position, whatever happened to me, I put myself in that position. So I, I, I take full responsibility of what happened to me, uh, what happened, the situation. And I, and I was negligent and ignorant. I take full responsibility for it. I, I still feel bad for my young self who got involved with something. Uh, maybe I was immature, um, you know, didn't have the right mentality, wasn't like strong, in my strong enough in my convictions. So I definitely feel like I got taken advantage of. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to make excuses, but I feel like for sure I got taken advantage of like crazy. But I feel totally responsible for it because I did it to myself because no one made me sign that paperwork. I did it. So it's so I got punished for it, and I paid like a really heavy heavy price. And I feel like I lost years of my life in a way from it. And I did it to myself. So no, no one made me sign the paperwork. No one forced me. I could have walked out and, and said, forget it. But at the time, I felt like I couldn't. I had a lot of pressures, I felt like, at that time. I had a different mentality. I, I, you know, I was married, a lot of pressures, uh, financial. And I felt like I couldn't lose my job. And then my job got threatened. And I just felt like I was weak. And I just can only blame myself. Thank you for that. I have no further questions. Hi, Mr. Stoller. Hi. I have a few questions. Um, I was wondering, have you shared uh, in detail to your friends, family, and your current Pilates clients the details of why your license was revoked? So friends, yes. Um, I had a, some of the clients, yeah, if they asked. Um, but, you know, for a while, I had uh, group classes. So I had thousands of clients coming through the studio. I had like Groupon clients coming in and living social. So I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna just share this information with people, they don't ask. But if people, private clients ask me, you know, why, aren't, why can't you practice or why aren't you practicing? Then I have to embarrass, it's embarrassing and you know, I kind of have to explain, well, you know, I had some issues that happened and, you know, I surrendered my license. And I just haven't felt like I'm um, able to go back uh, and get it. And so the people that are my private clients, they we're like close. So I can, I talk to them about it, they ask. But if it's just random people coming in, they, I'm not going to just announce, announce it. It's not necessary. It's, embarrassing and, and they're not asking okay. so so if you were to get your license back and you said you just really want to be able to treat your current Pilates clients um, and say one of your current clients gets into a car accident it will ha happen and they say and you say no 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 I don't want it I, I don't do insurance and they say oh come on please you know I've seen you for 10 years um, how are you going to handle that? Well, I, I'm just not going to do it because for, for a number of reasons on top of that, I just never really liked dealing with, uh, you know, that, that whole world. I really didn't like it. I actually never dealt with the attorneys directly myself. It was the people I was involved with who were dealing with them. I was only dealing with the patients. And so I don't like that world of you know, and I don't, and I'm not going to do it. So, will you refer them to somebody else? Um, I don't have anybody to refer them to. I'll just tell them to go find somebody. You know. Okay. 
And do you, your current Pilates uh, clients, are they, what ages are they? Do you see older clients? I, yeah, I mean, uh, some, some kind of, um, some in their 20s, but very rare, mostly 30s, 40s, 50s, and older. Mostly older clients. Okay. Um, and so what if uh, you have a client that um, is, you know, 65 or older, and they have Medicare, um, and they want you to treat them, but how are you going to manage that? What will you tell them? Um, I haven't thought about that, but I don't want to take insurance. So I, I have to find out how that how that works as far as what if I just don't take insurance. I just don't want to be a provider for Medicare. I never was, I don't believe. And, um, and so if the, that particular client says, oh, well, um, that's okay, you don't have to bill it, I'll just pay you cash, mm -hmm. what will be, what, what's your response to that? I'm, I have to find out if it's legal. I have to just find out if that's ethical. And I just don't want to do anything that I can get in trouble for. So I would find out if that if that is a legitimate thing to do. Okay. But ideally, I just don't want to take any insurance or third-party payers. Okay. And have you done any volunteer work? Um, I, I did as part of my um, you know, my um, probation sentence. Mm -hmm. I did like something like 450 hours of volunteer cleaning the street. Okay. Um, and then you had mentioned that the things that had happened, you allowed them to happen because you weren't, I think you used the words, um, you weren't strong in character, um, but that you feel that you are now. Um, is there anything tangible that you can describe to us that um, kind of gives us a better feeling of what has changed with your character? Well. Uh, for one, I, the people I surround myself with. I just only surround myself with hardworking, ethical people, you know, that I can uh, learn from and look up to, one, such as my wife. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Um, well, I guess what I'm you know, we can try to surround ourselves with positive people that support us, but we don't live in a bubble. We will sure. come into contact with people that will try to take advantage of us or lie to us or whatever. And so I'm wondering what skills and what resources you have within yourself besides it's, to me, I think impossible to stay in your bubble. So what resources have you gained through the master's program and the books that you have read on how to navigate that? Well, I feel like I just have an understanding of people now. And I can tell when someone has good intentions, I feel like, mm -hmm. and uh, bad intentions. And so I just have a feeling now, which I didn't have before, maybe for whatever reason. I just accepted everyone and sort of trusted a lot of people. and. Uh, kind of people pleasing too. But now I just feel like I can pick out who's, uh, who's good intentions, who has bad, and I know how to, if, even if someone is maybe, I, I don't want to get so involved with them or something like that, I know how to navigate the relationship and set boundaries, which I didn't know before. But now I feel like I can set boundaries with people. Okay. Um, do, you still, do you still feel angry about what happened? Um, angry at myself a little bit sometimes if I th start thinking about it, like listening, for example, to this to the case, I can still feel upset at myself. Mm -hmm. I can still go that to that place where I feel like, how could how could I allow myself to do these things, or how can I get, how can I allow myself to get involved in that? Yeah, I can. I feel some. I, I don't know if it's anger, it's just like disappointment in myself. And what about to the other um, party that? It's, 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 I feel wronged in some ways. Mm -hmm. As a, if I look at, if I think about myself as a young guy coming out of school, kind of like baby faced and, you know, sort of feeling, I guess I feel 
kind of that they did something bad to me. Yeah, I mean, I can't let, I can't feel happy about that. Okay, I just have uh, one last question. You had mentioned that you didn't do the counseling because of the cost, um, but then you had said that you took classes and did a master's. Yeah. Um, was that less expensive than counseling, or? So that came way after. Okay. Yeah, like when I, that first this thing happened to me, that's when I couldn't afford therapy. Uh-huh. And so the counseling thing, I did it way later on, once my Pilates business was, I was able to afford it. Okay. Years later. Okay, great. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Stoller. I have a few um, questions and, and kind of extensions of things that may have been asked. Um, just for clarification, it appears from the records here that you um, provided information on continuing education that you completed in 2020, 2022, and just one class in 2021. Throughout the rest of that time, did you take any coursework or did you feel that it was necessary? Um, so I also I actually took a class that wasn't included in there, added it. I just recently took a class in 22 also. Okay. Um, but so all those other years are be, what I'm referring to. So I just did uh, studying on my own uh, and I also studied a lot of anatomy and went back into my books and studied physiology and, and that I did that to help me with my Pilates uh, skills, knowledge. And, and um, I read journals and um, I was very busy growing the Pilates business. And so I was working like 12, 14 hour days. And uh, so I, I did as much as I could then on my own, uh, but, but I didn't take any classes like official uh, chiropractic uh, education classes and then I started taking them once I start, started to feel confident enough where I felt like okay I want to try to get my license back. So your license was um, revoked back in 2012 and so what I'm hearing and correct me if I'm wrong is between 2012 and 2020 you didn't feel like you wanted to get your license back is that what I'm hearing? I, I felt very depressed and I didn't, th I didn't think I could. Okay. And so I just, I still studied books and, and read my books, my chiropractic books, and, and tried to, you know, keep, my, keep the chiropractic kind of like education in my mind because I just still felt like, okay, I have the diploma still, so I just want to retain the knowledge, but I didn't know if I'm going to be able to get my license back. I didn't, I didn't feel like comfortable even thinking about going and getting my license back at that time. I just wasn't in the right mental state. So you just said um, a few minutes ago that you studied your anatomy and all of your books, mm -hmm. but that was for Pilates. Right. Well, the chiropractic stuff, I felt like related to Pilates because it has to do with all the muscles and, and the functioning of the body. So I felt like it was helping me in my um, Pilates um, knowledge. Okay. Um, you, going back to counseling, um, you mentioned that initially you felt like you needed counseling, but you didn't pursue it because you didn't have money. Did you ever think to look for um, institutions, nonprofits that offer free services because there are a lot. I, did, I didn't really, that didn't even come into my mind. I just thought you have to pay. And I, I went a few times and it was expensive and I just couldn't afford it. So I never even considered that I could get uh, free counseling or anything. I never even considered that. So I just started reading self-help books and trying to help myself. Um, going back um, to, actually, I'll ask it this way. If um, you are given your 
an opportunity to practice again on probation. You mentioned earlier that you had not um, been transparent with what you have done um, and the reason you lost your license because you're seeing pay, uh, clients in the Pilates atmosphere. But if given the opportunity to go back to chiropractic, you'll be seeing patients. Who then will you be transparent with about what you have done and why you're on probation? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm transparent with anyone who I come across who I have a personal interaction who, when the circumstances are where they ask me, I, I tell them what, you know, what happened. So I'm not, I'm transparent. I just, um, when I, when I wasn't, when I said I wasn't transparent, it's just that when you have people coming through the studio on a voucher and you, you don't personally interact with them that much, you just come in and take the class and leave. So I'm, I, I can't really, there's not a circumstance to be transparent or talk, talk about this kind of stuff, unless you get to know someone personally. Okay, so let's go back, um, and I'd like to revisit some of the continuing ed um, information. You stated that the courses that you took appeared to be the same or similar. Um, as I reviewed the information, in 2020, it appears you repeated courses somewhere between eight and ten times, and in 2022, you repeated the exact same course four times. You said that that they were not the same exact course, but if we go to BCE 006, 10, 10, 2020, it, the ethics and law um, indicates that it's practical, as well as 12, 20, 2020, ethics and law says practical. Now, some of them, as you stated, do say something a little different, but uh, there are a lot that don't. There are a lot of them that say the exact same things. My question to you is, do you think that repeating, particularly because there's so many courses within just a couple of months in the same year, do you think that that's a meaningful attempt to complete your continuing education requirements by repeating the same courses over and over? Well, um, I, th I do think that there are some courses that repeated, although some of them were with different instructors, which I specifically tried to get a different instructor uh, because this this one of the one of the uh, places where I was taking classes they have a lot of instructors there and so uh, sometimes maybe repeated but I felt like I still got something out of it because when something's repeated you get you you catch things you, you get more and it's the information I feel like there's still a benefit to repeating something sometimes and um, so I did my best to um, take as many classes as I, as I could and use my time wisely and uh, there are some some repeats um, but I still felt like I got something out of it some knowledge out of it do you feel like that you would get more out of getting a variety of perspectives not from the same provider even because oftentimes the same provider even different instructors have similar um, curricula. So do you feel that it would be just as beneficial to do it in a different way, or do you feel that this is the most beneficial way? No, um, I think you have a good point, and that's why I tried to um, take classes from, um, there was a one that was like a yoga chiropractic, uh, and then I went to one called Back to Chiropractic, and then I went to Dr. Tong seminars, and then I went to another one called uh, from Kirk Meyer. So I felt like I tried my best to get variety. It was a little bit also challenging because it was uh, COVID going on at the time. So live seminars, like I, I looked at the board and I was trying to find um, seminars to go to and they were all canceled most a lot of them were canceled and uh, so I was having trouble finding seminars so I I'm looking here and there's a, approximately 20 from back to chiropractic courses 
um, just um, as a reflection. Um, I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, to my left. Almost afternoon, but good morning to you. Um, a couple things that I I want to to hit on. I appreciate your your candor and your answers thus far. Um, I want to get. I felt like in the direct examination or the cross examination earlier there were some gaps, and I'm trying to get a little picture of of what. So you got your license in 1999. And then you said you got hired by this chiropractor that you worked in his office. Is that correct? Yes. Um, that wasn't right away. Okay. Uh, so help, help fill in the gaps of the timeline. You got your license in 1999 and you started working for this chiropractor in the L.A. County area. I got my license and then uh, one of my first jobs was actually, I was going to, I was in a multidisciplinary pain management clinic okay. in Lancaster, California. And I was uh, working with a, uh, uh, medical doctors and, and um, they were doing pain management and so I was just in, doing physiotherapy type of stuff ultrasound uh, uh, electric stimulation some activator adjustments these these uh, these people were um, couldn't really you have to be very careful with them because they were had very bad injuries and so I, I did that for a couple of years and then um, I tried to uh, open a uh, kind of a rent space in a clinic, not a clinic, it was a colonic hydrotherapy place in Beverly Hills. And so I rented space there and tried to get, you know, sort of build a practice from the people going through getting, working on their digestive systems. And so that, that was, a, it was there a couple of years. And so um, then I met um, this, through my ex-wife's father, I met this individual who, I, who where I got the job, uh, where the problems came from. So approximately what year was that when you... It's, it's hard. Just approximately. Maybe 2006, maybe 2005 or something. Okay. I don't know. And you started there in that practice for a little bit, and then you said you went to another location where you were solo by yourself. Right. That was, what? The, that was the gentleman's satellite office, okay. and then that's where he said, you're going to go work there. And um, that's maybe 2005. I, I don't know. I, I don't remember the dates exactly. I would have to, like, really um, figure it out. So prior to that, moving to the satellite office, were you doing any billing? So you were having people within the office that you were working in were doing the building. You were just doing the chart notes right. and the treatment of the patient. Yes, I never did any billing. So then when you, went to two, when you went to the satellite office in approximately 2005, when this fraud started, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, that, that's when this situation happened, yes. I note that you refer to it often as a situation or a thing that kind of happened, like it's kind of over there. No, it's... But you understand it's, it's right here within you that... Right. You, okay. Yes, I understand. All right. I take responsibility for it. So when you're, when you're in that satellite office, are you doing the billing now? I did not do the billing. So who's doing the billing? The, the doctor. So the, the primary office is doing the billing for you? Yes. You're seeing the patient, yes. And you're keeping the chart notes that you're providing to support the bill. They, they were in the office, yes. And were there procedures that you were performing in the, that satellite office that you were that you were providing chart notes and billing for that you did not perform? There ended up being, according, yeah, there were there were things on there that weren't done. When did you become aware during that 2005 to what time period were you in that satellite office? I'm sorry. You, you said around 2005 you started in that satellite office. Around that time, approximately. The yeah. time period from the 2005 to when, how long did you stay in that satellite office pro um, providing treatment to? A few, few years, I think. 
Excuse there was me? A few years. There was a few years in that office. I think I was there for a few years. Okay. When in that, when did you become aware that fraud was occurring in that time frame? Um, I was really became aware when all of a sudden there was a, there was a, like a, investigators came in one morning. And that's when I became aware of it. I, I really didn't understand what was going on. But investigators came in and they took files. And that's, that's really, that's really uh, when I thought something was going on. So that according to this, the, that investigation took place around 2006 to 2007. And then did, when you saw the investigators come in, did you continue practicing? Um, I continued practicing. In that satellite office? Yeah. And you were aware from that point then that there was fraud, and that's when you acknowledged that you continued to do it because you felt pressure and you were weak. Yeah. And the, the thing is, at that point, I was already kind of, uh, I, did, I was kind of like, it was kind of like an overwhelming situation. I didn't know what was going on at that time. And I just sort of, uh, sort of didn't, I didn't want to practice there anymore. So I'm not sure exactly how much longer I practiced there because there were there was um, there were still patients there and there was a personal injury uh, cases there and I and I felt like you know I felt like I, they were legit they were they were I didn't think that there was all these this is all fraud I didn't think that it was I thought this was like normal genuine cases and there, there's people coming in so I didn't feel like I can just walk out on them so I continued for a while longer I don't remember exactly how long but then I ended up leaving that that clinic you'd stated earlier on cross-examination that you, you know that you were weak that you felt pressure because um, you were going to lose your job and one of the things that I feel like that that I'm still needing from you is is you really haven't answered the why. You've used the terms kind of maybe I was this and I was desperate and kind of like you're almost almost kind of mitigating it. But but I want to know the the why. Why didn't you walk away? And what what assurance that that you can walk away in the future if it if that's presented? Because you've had some good questions from this panel about potential situations you may find yourself in. So what's the why you didn't? And why you will now? So, I guess I was uh, weak before, and uh, wasn't strong enough in character, and I felt kind of uh, a lot of pressure. Like I don't know. Um, I mean, I just I had my ex-wife who was uh, pressuring me. Uh, she didn't work, and I just felt a lot of pre financial pressure, and also pressure. Um, you know, just, just to get my career going, which I never felt like I really got it going. I was never, I never felt like I was uh, able to uh, be um, successful enough to, uh, I guess, uh, to, to meet our needs, our family needs. And so I felt a lot of pressure. And then when uh, I felt like my I guess I didn't feel confident enough that I could just walk away and get another job. I felt not confident enough. And uh, I feel differently now because I just feel um, I, have con I have confidence. I know I can, I can um, ethically make a good living doing through the Pilates. And uh, so I feel totally like, like a different person. Before I felt like a different, like a kind of a different. I'm, I'm like a different person now. So it's a totally. I feel like it's a totally different um, situation. Like I would never be in again. So you feel now that where you're at, you can support yourself and your family financially. Yes, and also I have a supportive wife, uh, supportive, supportive ethical wife, who encourages me. You know, 
she's she's inspiring and she's very ethical, uh, good person. So I feel like um, my circumstances are totally different too. But you know, regardless, I wouldn't be with my if she wasn't like that. I wouldn't be she wouldn't be my wife. So I just feel like, like I said, I've changed my life. I've changed who I'm surrounding myself with, and I've changed as a person. So I just don't feel like I could ever be in that situation again. So, so having your license restate, reinstated is not so much a need, it's more of a want. Is that accurate? It's, yes. It's that you want, want to practice chiropractic again and serve I want to help your community in a different way than you have been. Yes, I want to help, help people with chiropractic and I want to be that, I want to have that same inspiration I had when I went to school and the excitement and inspiration I had when I came out of school. I want to function on that level. So if your license is reinstated and you're on probation, you're going to have to disclose to anybody that you provide chiropractic care to what happened yes. and why you're on probation. Full disclosure, transparency. You seem reticent to do that. I will and I understand that. it's embarrassing, but that's going to have to happen. I will disclose it. Thanks for your, your answers. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, I, I do just kind of want to follow up on um, Dr. Adams' question. Um, how, how would you characterize or how would you describe if you're being transparent with uh, future patients or even people that have come to the Pilates practice in the, in the past, how do you describe uh, the situation that led to you losing your license? So uh, someone asked me, uh, just you know, an example, I just one of my uh, clients asked me, why aren't you practicing? And I just say, well, I, I surrendered my license, I had a legal issue. And um, I got into a, I just explained that I got into a, a bad situation and um, that I had a criminal case and I tell them exactly you know what it was for the uh, business and professional code 650 and then I just explained that um, you know it's a major regret that I feel ashamed of and that I've worked on uh, cleaning my record as much as I could and uh, that, that's pretty much it. I, I saw, I was reading the, uh, your written statement to the board on uh, BCE 3 in the middle of the page. You, you said, I had a completely clear record and was a model citizen. I made this one very bad and shameful mistake, which I deeply regret. Uh, do you consider the, the circumstances which led to your revocation to be one mistake? No. A, I guess there's a, a lot of mistakes that went on, um, but I just I looked at the situation. I guess as one uh, situation, but it is a lot of like at the time. A lot of uh, if I look back now, there was a lot of red flags and a lot of uh, things that I should have. Um, been more attentive to and and been more um, responsible over. So there's a, there's a number of things. If I look back now, and, uh, did you describe to the references that you provided today? Um, did you describe for them the circumstances of uh, your the revocation of your license? To the. To the we we got two letters. Um, one from George or Jorge Gomez and one from Cynthia Figueroa. Well, they they know that I had some issue. We didn't go into detail about the issue of, of that I had. I didn't go into detail with them. Why not? Um, we we don't get into a deep conversation about it because, um, I mean, I feel I feel a. Uh, responsible for what I did um, and 
you know, I told them that I had an issue, but I didn't get into detail because they didn't really, they don't really ask. They don't, they know me as a person and we, we have a good relationship and they just don't ask like with the detail. Like if I tell them, okay, I had a billing problem or, it, it, you know, an issue with the, with the um, legal issue that happened uh, in chiropractic, they just don't go and they don't ask me, well, tell me exactly what happened. So I just didn't get into like a uh, deep conversation about it with them. I, I don't want to like necessarily like, you know, when they come in, they want to feel good and they want to be a positive vibe doing Pilates. And I don't want to put that on them, like have a conversation that they're not interested in, in a way. They're not asking for that conversation. So the people are close to me, you know, I. I can tell them about it, but a lot of people don't want it. Honestly, I just feel like don't even want to hear all this detail. They got their own life and problems and they just don't, it doesn't seem like it makes sense for me to like put that on them. You also mentioned uh, 450 hours of community service. What, what was the nature of that service? I was cleaning the street, um, trash with a bunch of people. For that was the entirety of the 450 hours? Yes. Nothing further. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I've heard is that you've done a lot, a fair amount of personal steps, uh, kind of to change your personal and professional environment. It's kind of what I've, what I've been hearing. And in general, access to a network of diverse, a diverse professional network is good for any business owner in general. So in the event your license is reinstated, what resources are you aware of or that you currently have access to? Um, do you feel would help you, and I'm gonna kind of name off a couple things, I wanna say with navigating a lot of the a lot of the hypothetical billing scenarios mentioned before but also navigating kind of the expectations of what it means to be on probation such as you know things mentioned earlier where um, you know the level of disclosure that's needed to provide right so you know a combination of the scenarios you'll run into right in terms of billing but also navigating the probation processes as well uh, I haven't like exactly thought about that but I know that there's a lot of um, useful um, resources in this website uh, from where I took a lot of my uh, classes on my online class and some of my live classes too they have a whole resource page of DCs who are willing to uh, help you with uh, billing or adjusting or office management and so I, I thought about utilizing that, but I don't have any other um, sort of like resources right now. Thank you. All right. Any further questions from our board members? No. Uh, Ms. Crawford, anything further? No, thank you. Anything further that you would like to add? Um, I mean, just just want to tell the board that I understand it's a big responsibility for the board to, you know, give my license back. That you're there to protect the public, the interest of the public, and I, I, I know that that's a big responsibility. And um, I just want the board to know that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, these are it's just me saying this. So I, you know, I, I mean, I, I just whatever the the thing that, the things that happened before is out of character, and I've always been an ethical uh, person, and I just wanted to, um, you know, again reassure the board that I've just never put myself in these kind of situation, the situation I had before, and um, that. I just uh, want to reassure the board that 
I want to make the profession proud and not embarrass the profession anymore because I feel like in a way that's what I've done. I kind of didn't, never wanted to do it and then I, it's a crazy situation that I became part of that world that embarrassed the chiropractic profession. And so that's really hard for me to, you know, it's a hard thing to go through and, and accept that I, I added to the negativity in chiropractic in a way. Never wanted to, and that I never would do that again if I get my license back. That I only want to do good, to, you know, I only want to do good for the profession or to the profession. That's it. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any closing remarks, Ms. Crawford? No, thank you. Is the matter submitted? Yes. Mr. Stoller, matter submitted? Matter submitted matter, to the board? Matter submitted. All right, matter is submitted, and we are off the record. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoller. So at this time, uh, we're going to move the board into a uh, closed session, and that will encapsulate our lunchtime also, and we will reconvene after the closed session. Are we on a set time for that? No, there's no set Okay. Okay. And uh, we will reconvene after closed session. And I don't believe we need a motion, so... We are now in close, and as soon as everybody, as soon as we clear out the room, we'll be in closed session.